working. <sighs> Go live. Um. Okay. Give me a second. Something's just not working quite right. Definitely a lot better, and I'm not gonna have to worry about that for the next 20 30 minutes. All right, because that would be an annoying the life out of me. Hello, everyone. Let's see how's this camera gonna line up because everything's restarted. So, yes, as is usual, when I restart, the camera goes back to a interesting setting, and as you can see now, I am. Merely a face. I'm a mouth. I, I am a naval history mouth. That's that's all I am. I'm being reduced to a naval history mouth. Let me go to there. Let me do that. So, hello everyone. Ugh. How are we all doing? Right then. I should have live chat up. I should have pop out the chat and have that up. Hello, Claw. Uh, uh, chooch, chooch. I've got a new. I've got a support. New supporter, apparently. Thank you. Hello, Chooch. And still, I love it when it flashes those things up. Me. It's always. It's always cool to learn. Um, let's see. All the stuff that's going. Ooh. I've apparently missed 36 frames due to a rendering lag out of 99,800, so... I think I'm okay. I think I'm doing okay. So, let's say hello to everyone. And yes, it is a funny accent day. Uh, I, I do apologise in advance, but it's been a funny accent day all day. And it's probably going to keep being a funny accent day, because, well, it's been one of those days. It's been one of those weeks, but, you know, we, 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 we get past it eventually. But yes, it is definitely a funny accent day. So, I, I, I apologise. Um, but not too much, because I'm still going to be doing the funny accents. I will still be doing the funny accents. So, whilst I'm sorry I'm doing the funny accents, because, you know, you don't necessarily deserve the funny accents, no one really deserves the funny accents, they are going to be coming. So, let's say hello to everyone. Hello. Why can I... Why is it not letting me see the people who are at the top? Okay, so there is someone above Runon. Who I should be able to say hello to. But the joyous thing that is um, the chat system is not letting me say hello to anyone above Runon because at 6.27pm for some reason. So that's happening. Hello, Servant Kratu. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Steve Clark. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, DH89. Hello, uh, Mark Harkness. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, Runon. I've certainly said hello, Runon, but hello, Night to everyone. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Jacob W5570. Hello, Adrian Verdon. Hello, DG40. Hello, Tanef Velika. And hello, Joss Vonk. And hello, Garius. 
Go for it. As a fellow OBS bot owner, the most disturbing uh, setting I can turn to is headless, i.e. chest cam. Yes. Okay, I actually have a, a thing for that. When I had it the first in auto mode, I had one of my cartoon shirts on, and it decided that the face on my shirt was more realistic than this face. Hello, Blackburn Maxwell. Hello, Tim and Alan Moran. Uh, hello, Andrew Cox. Hello, Darius Radzky. <laughs> hello, Nordic Wolf. Hello, Paul Amos. Hello, Richards. Hello, everyone. Right then, and welcome to... Well, Battle Cruisers and Battleships are separate categories in the Washington Naval Treaty. Now, there are three reasons why I agreed to do this. Uh, why I just decided to do this, actually. One, it kept coming third, fourth, fifth, third, fourth, third, fourth, fifth, third, 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 fourth, fifth, and finally third again. And I was just going, I'm just going to do it, because I'm going to end up doing it anyway. And uh, it quite fits with all the technology stuff we're doing in this period. So thank you to the people who kept voting for it in Patreon. There is a Patreon vote currently live at the moment. There are about three potential winners of all the vote of all of them, but if enough people go in and vote, it could change. Hello, Avis. Ah, I think it was Avis who was the one at the top who I couldn't see because I think that I sort of that looks similar to the um, bottom of the the, the, the sort of the, the symbol. Hello, Leslie, and hello, Nautical Wolf, and Dietrowski. And so, second reason. It fits. First reason, it kept being voted for. And third reason. It's actually potential history. Because for both the Japanese and the British, conceding to make them part of the same category went against their initial, some of their initial instructions and some of their initial perspectives. So, especially if the British hadn't wanted to concede, things could have been very, very different. But as always when I do alternate history, I'm going to start off by going through the actual history. In, our, in this case, I'm going to go through the actual terminology and agreement of the treaty, because that seems to be the best point to start. If we start with the discussion points and then of the treaty, then go to the treaty and then work our way back to reevaluate those discussion points, we're going to be, go down a rabbit hole which can get to some very weird places. Including at one point a discussion as to whether or not ships should be allowed to carry flamethrowers. I kid you not, that was a discussion point at one so no, at one point, according to one of the diaries I've read at the time, I don't know if it was a full table discussion or room discussion, or whether it was merely a particularly passionate individual bringing it up, uh, bashing it in the ear of anyone who was near but enough by to hear it. In which case, whilst they might well be dead, I feel it's worthwhile apologising to them on that individual's behalf, because whilst they are no relation of mine, they were... They were Cornish, so in that way, all those of us who have some Cornish descent can claim appropriate opium for it. Or, or rather, obrium. I haven't got to the Shamus book plug yet. Now, that is actually the first uh, problem you've come into, Andrew Cox. I think battle cruisers should be included in the cruiser time limits. Washington doesn't have cruiser tonnage limits. Washington only defines all other ships that are not battleships, or rather capital ships or aircraft carriers, can be no, can be no more than 10,000 tons. So you actually have to add in a fifth category, or rather a fourth category. You have three categories in the Washington Naval Treaty. Capital ships, carriers, and others. So, you adding in battle cruisers, you're making that up to four categories. And I should also say thank you to Steve Clark, who was the one who kept suggesting this topic. Very patiently. 
<laughs> um yeah <laughs> greek fire ship based flame for us it's all fun as always a shameless book plug because without everyone supporting this channel and especially today because um as you all know i have been talking i always do talk openly about the joys of being a junior lecturer and a contract lecture and how some and actually the um, university which I mentioned a while back ago and they'd point out had had issues if they decided to sort of not carry on employing um, rather abruptly rather a large number of us it seems um, I was expecting the final paycheck today it didn't arrive I wasn't surprised but I would be in a far, far different state and a far, far different position if it wasn't thanks to all the people who support the channel, who watch the videos, see the adverts, and subscribe to the channel, all the people who are patrons, and all the people who bought this and are buying this still because the new edition is out. It's cool, and there are more books to follow. So thank you. So, the Washington Treaty is applied to capital ships. Now, I include this because I think it's important to show the actual terminology and discussion. This is the treaty, what it means. But let's be honest, this slide is far easier to talk through. So, for those who don't know and don't follow my, uh, don't uh, don't answer patron, these slides do, when I remember and I get round to it and I actually have the free time to organise and collect them properly, do appear in Patreon. and there's a whole load which are going to be going up next month at some point, because actually I have been teaching someone to be able to run Patreon for me. So if, it, in, in a truly disturbing sign, I, I would suggest, but actually it's because uh, when I asked people who were close enough to me that I would trust them to run Patreon who would like to volunteer to run it, the one who's offered to run it and make sure the slides go up and make sure that I don't miss comments and messages on it because I keep seeing to messenger, miss, miss them on Patreon, is my mother. So... <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's a good thing, bad thing, or a scary thing, <laughs> but you'll all be able to decide, because next month she's going to be giving it a go. <sighs> that, that's going to be fun. But anyway, we have, this is the full details of the slide. This is in full, full, lovely, verbose, diplomatic language. But what does it go through to? Well, it's this. Individual limit is 35,000 tons for ships, standard. The gun caliber limit is 16 inches. The ratio is RNs allowed 5 ships, the USN is allowed 5 ships, the IJN are allowed 3 ships, and the Marine National and Rage of Marine are each allowed 1.75 ships for that equivalent. The RN and the US are equal, but both have a six ship superiority over the IJN for a force of 15, 15, 9, 5, and 5, according to the tonnage amount allowance. When you look into the actual number of vessels, this number does not accord on them. But the thing is, the minimum number of capital ships the USN were prepared to accept and the US Congress were prepared to accept for the USA was 15 battleships. The US were very obsessed with having a battle line of 15 ships. That was considered essential. Their requirement was 15 ships, so they had an overwhelming fighting advantage over the IJN. And the thing is, one of the issues which causes the battle cruisers to be combined in is because the, uh, the, the only other scenario the USN can see that going down is the battle cruisers being a separate category, in which case... They would need to complete some battle cruisers, the Lexington class probably, and they would still want their 15 battleships, which would give all of the other powers an increase in their relative vessels. A 
Sigla, I think you'll be paying for those services in Sunny Lunches. The, there is agreements have been worked out, and yes, it will be me cooking certain meals. Uh, not Sundays or Thursdays, but I am taking on another meal a week. <laughs> New edition is out, out Monday the 30th of October. It's available for pre-order now, I think. <laughs> there seems to be a current debate in chat about how scared they should be of my mum. <laughs> Look, she's raised two academics and at one point was pretty much head of HR for Lloyd's Register in the 1970s. Um... In a period where, yeah, she was, she's capable. She's learning the computer skills. That's the only, the, the thing that's been keeping her back. So she's, I've been teaching her Patreon and how to manage the stuff for it. Mainly the, the stuff of uploading these things and just checking it daily while I'm doing other stuff. Now. Andrew Cox, if Battlecruz is a separate class, they could set the Battlecruz limit at 45,000 tons and they wouldn't need, uh, wouldn't need to have an exception for Hood. We'll be getting into that. Uh, you are not far off, but you are actually over overstating what I think they do. Because honestly, I don't think they're going to be that generous. I'm not really, I wouldn't say I'm hiring her, it's just I was looking at, and this is off topic, but I would say it's not so much hiring her as with all the other stuff we've got going on, I'm getting further and further behind in the uploads of these. And the thing is, it's much more useful I do the other things I'm doing in the house, and as you know, we've been we've had a lot of issues. I've been open about on this in the house, and we are considering sort of moving and those sort of things. It's better I do that with my time than, and then she is happy that she's doing this because it also fills in. So it's sort of a case of it's for the period of the next few months a sort of role swap because I just looked and went, I'm about a year behind on these uploads. That's terrible. And that's because every time I'm supposed to have a monthly day where I'm going to be up doing the uploads and making sure they're all uploaded, uh, it gets swept aside by other things. So, um, and when I was saying, oh, you'll just be one day a month and you can, you can do it then, she wanted to do more because she felt that was more equal. So, um, it, the role expanded. The role expanded, but mostly it was from her side because she was wanting something to do with her time more than from my side wanting someone to do more of a management role. I'm still slightly worried about it. But, yeah. So. That's the Washington Treaty as far as capital ships go. Now, first things first, it's going to probably shock a few people. I've got the aircraft carrier stuff in here as well, because... The aircraft carriers are set in relation to the capital ships. Well, now we're changing the capital ship scenario. And one of the criteria, one of the things that go through is the sort of the likely amount of high speed capital ships wandering around. So, how fast will the carriers have to go to be able to maybe outrun them and how much power will they need and what, how, many carry, how many capital ships will you be supporting? Because remember, spotting was a key part of capital shit of carrier duties in this period when they're talking about 1920s and they're looking at carriers they're talking about spotting that's a major thing for them and it will be a major thing right into the 1930s right into world war ii if we consider what is the swordfish doing for the uh, for war spite at narvik is she just aimlessly flying around no She's not just doing reconnaissance and scouting, she's also spotting, marking positions for the guns, telling the gunners where the targets are going to be. 
That's what the swordfish is there for. And spotting is a very, very powerful and very important tool for aviation in the 1920s and 30s. It's something it's very easy for people to uh, ignore. But then let's put it a different way. Let's say you were talking about an aircraft hovering with a laser, de uh, sort of a helicopter with a laser designator or something, putting in a marker and then sending the signal back to artillery. That's the modern equivalent of spotting. It's still a very powerful tool. The aircraft itself doesn't have to carry the weight of the ammunition, the explosive, the delivery. It just has to ca carry out the reconnaissance, which means the aircraft can be lighter and faster. And the heavy artillery back there can do a lot more damage because it's more accurate. Sir Gregory, if Britain was allowed to keep Hood and the Japanese had the Congos, why wasn't the US allowed to build this one like Lexington? Well, the problem for the Americans is that they considered Hood equivalent to a Colorado. And they basically decided that they didn't. They were getting the Colorados. The British get Nelson and Rodney, so they have equality. But the trouble is, the Lexingtons are forty-two thousand tons, and in standard. And if you build them, you are going to have to deal with that. And the thing is. The moment you have the Americans having a 42,000 ton standard and the British having a 41,400 ton standard, officially according to the Washington Treaty. Please note when I'm saying the figures, I'm talking about what is officially admitted in the Washington Naval Treaty. Okay? If anyone comes in and goes, but it wasn't that weight. I don't really care. Because for the purposes of the treaty, we have to believe the powers involved. It's like you have to believe that Lexington and Saratoga were 33,000 tons in standard displacement. Exactly. You might not think that was actually likely true. You're thinking there's a lot of rounding going on there. But that is what you have to believe because that's what's omitted in the treaties. So with aircraft carriers, you get an individual limit of 27,000 tons, which is 8,000 tons less than the capital ships. Gun caliber limit of 8 inches. Ratios go through roughly the same officially. Unofficially, the ratios allowed by tonnage once you get into them are RN5, USN5, IJN3, Marine Nationale 2.2 and Rage Marina 2.2. And the reason is... That is, and that's why uh, it, that is because otherwise the Ma uh, Marine National and the Rage Marina couldn't have what was considered decent-sized aircraft carriers. Also, the Royal Navy, USN, and IJN are allowed to build two ships of up to thirty-three thousand tons. Marine National and the Rage Marina couldn't because, honestly, their limit was less <laughs> than that would accommodating two such vessels. Um. Interestingly note, again, the Royal Navy don't do that. Courageous and Glorious and Furious, none of them come anywhere near 33,000 tons. They don't even top 27,000 tons. Officially. Or a drone for spotting these days, as Lizzie Mitchell says. Mark Cooch, will the fluffy research assistants be assisting? Uh, 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 the, the new junior tech I mean, admin. Um, potentially, probably knowing them. I it is it is kind of cool of her to be helping, and it's it's because she, she sort of the, the whole discussion. I have to admit, and this is going off topic again, but so I will. I saw sort of, but it was kind of interesting discussion when it came up over the um over the last couple of days. Was I she does X Y Z for my sister, uh, you know various things she helps my sister out with, and she went. I don't do anything to help you, and you're doing all this stuff, so why don't I take on this task because I can while we're going through all the busy period? Because the trouble is, again, with her waiting for surgery for, uh, for well, her knees more than her hips, really, and her arthritis, she isn't moving around as much as she used to, so she is sitting in her, sitting on her computer for quite a lot most days. And honestly, 
She finds quite a lot of the internet boring, although she does watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I'm told she does comment on some of them, so again, it's fun. So here is what is the criteria, because you see, theoretically, what was being built in this period are all roughly 40,000 ton vessels. And that was the interesting stats going through. Uh, HMS Hood, I said 41,400 tons. She's 41,200 tons officially. That's uh, so a standard displacement. Um, eight 15 inch guns. You know, she's recently entered service. You've got the Dakota class, the Key class. You've got the G3s also under construction in Britain, but they are far less far along than the South Dakotas and the Key class are, respectively. In terms of the design evolution. And in terms of them being pushed through by their governments. Hello, Longbow. They are an interesting scenario, all in all. They are an interesting scenario. So this is what we come down to, and this is the first point to which I'm going to have to start explaining quite a lot for this slide, because most of those slides are also in the Equitable Treaty series, and in various treaty videos, so they've come up a lot on this channel. The battle cruiser category. Well, the precedent was they used the largest ship in service as the basis of their requirements, the most recent ship. Well, the most recent battle cruiser in service is 42,000 tons standard. That's HMS Hood. Again, I was tempted to say 15 inch guns maximum for battle cruisers. I was tempted to put that in, as again, as that would have been a maximum in the battle cruiser category, but I have a feeling, considering they're supposed to have the same tra capital ship. Um, guns, uh, capital ships are supposed to, uh, you know, have the same guns and for the USN especially because they're building 16 inch gun ships, I have a feeling that the USN would go, no, it has to be 16 inch guns. And basically the criteria in the decision making process for this comes down to as the British and the Japanese both stick their foot in and go, no. This has to be a separate category, we have to maintain it. For the British, the argument is quite simple. We have to be able to have a naval presence in the Far East, in, well, in the Pacific, Indian, South Atlantic, North Atlantic, Oceans, and the Mediterranean. We can't do that with 15 ca with just 15 ships. We need to have our aircraft, ca we need to have our capital ship, our, our battle cruiser squadron. We need to have our rapid reaction squadron. So basically the Royal Navy going and Britain going, we can't join this treaty under this criteria. And I have a feeling the Americans would... You have to remember there's a change in leadership, there's a change in style, and it becomes so important for them to get the treaty. That if the British are really saying, that's our sticking point and we will walk away if you don't let us have that... I have a feeling they give in because they get most of what they want. And you have to remember, quite a lot of the American pushing in this treaty scenario is pushing for the minimum that people are going to accept. So if they, they don't push Britain below its minimum, they, try and, they push Japan below its minimum, but they don't push Britain below its minimum because Britain is one of those powers which if they walk away from the treaty, it's not necessarily good. It's also not necessarily bad, but it's not something... The and then everyone else is going to walk away from the treaty. If Britain leaves the treaty, the French will leave it, the Japanese will leave it, the Italians will definitely leave it. That happens, you have no treaty. And that's a problem for the Americans, because they don't want to spend the money on more defence. If if you want any proof of that, look at their funding of defence in the 1920s and in the early 1930s. Congress really didn't want to fund defence. They wanted to do other things with the money, mostly various interesting projects for themselves, not fund defence. So the criteria comes right then. Let's add in five vessels each. That's the limit for Britain and uh, Britain and America. They, the Britain gets a tonnage of 210,000 tonnes. The USN gets a tonnage of 210,000 pounds. The IGN gets a tonnage of 126,000 pounds. Uh, 6,000 tonnes. And I'm working this out. It's all in standard tonnage. It's all standard tonnage, not total tonnage, full load. Standard tonnage. 
Marine National, 73,500. Rager Marina, 73,500. The battleship category. Now, why does the battleship category change? Because if you're the US Navy, and you know that if you agree to that as your 5-5 five, five, free 1.75, 1.75 minimum, you know the British are going to be able to build some more battle cruisers. You're going to want as many battleships as you can, but you're also going to want those battleships to not be that far removed from battle cruisers. You've already got the scenario that you're saying that Hood is better than pretty much any of your battleships other than the Colorados, and that she can fight the Colorados, or is the equivalent value, although different, equivalent value to the Colorados. You're going to want things up. So the criteria moves up to give you a seven uh, to give you a five thousand ton differential between battleships and battle cruisers. It also confirms that battle cruisers are battle cruisers rather than being fast battleships because you don't have enough advantage to maintain speed and sufficient armor with five thousand tons differential between you and the battleships. So that's why I've kept it to a battle cruiser, as in two-word setting. That also fits with what the Royal Navy has, because the Royal Navy, as a rule, built uh, as it historically did, when uh, built one class, which were for gen generation battle cruiser one words, and usually built all the rest of the classes were actually either were built as battle cruiser two words or started out. In the Admiral class case, I would say start out as battle cruiser two words. They are economic warfare. They are global present ships, and the changes in Hood after Jutland are moving her along that spectrum towards a battle cruiser one word. But I don't think she actually reaches it for her generation. I think the thing that comes up when people start going saying she's a fast battleship and all sorts of things are more uh, more the fact that you have a lack of battleships as reference in that period, so it's easier to make those claims. Because there is an equivalent battleship built. Now, the battleship category and criteria then changes a bit. Britain and America still allowed 15 vessels because that's the American minimum. And the British are happy to accept that. Because then, if you think about that, that gives the British three battle squadrons one, ba um, one battle cruise squadron. It's the same with the Americans. They both end up with roughly 20, uh, with theoretically, on their total soon, 20 capital ships. But, next change, aircraft carrier category. Now, the aircraft carriers have gone up the most. They've gone up 5,000 tons. Why? Because they need to have their speed up. To be, and they need to have their, you know, their spe uh, speed up if they're going to be keeping up with battle cruisers and supporting them. And they need to have various things up to support it. And that, if you consider their... There are debates about the carrier category, and it will. Uh, I could have gone with thirty thousand tons. I did consider that, and then you have sort of a five and a seven thousand ton differential. But I decided to go with five and five just to make it nice and easier for me. I also modified the other ship criteria, the cruiser criteria, because again, if you have battle cruisers coming in and setting a limit at 42,000 tons for larger ships, and battleships have gone up by 30 to 37,000 tons, you're going to need to adjust down below. And for the Americans and the British, having battle cruisers part of the categories are, represent advantages, especially for the British. They also represent problems in that they mean your cruisers are more likely to come across a battle cruiser. In which case, you don't want necessarily the large light cruisers you are building which have 8 inch gun, uh, which will have 7.5 inch guns. You want the 9.2 inch gun, 12,000 ton vessel which the British design also had. So I've put that in, although that is one of the areas I'm least sure about, but it makes sense and fits with it. Okay. Let's go through the chat and respond to some of the questions. <laughs> Paul Johnson. I recently reached 35 years. I was working on my component and they have given me a large book token. Just wondering if Dr. Clark has any suggestions on what to buy with it. Honestly, I am going to be talking on Sunday. I'm going to be going through the latest releases in terms of books. Um, these are some of them. That I'm going to be going through on Sunday. So, yeah. 
Tune in Sunday for the Christmas book, uh, Christmas books uh, recommendations, Christmas gifts recommendations. There are some really good books from Pen and Sword Out. Um, the U.S. war debt threat in World War One is not as great as it is in World War Two, and also there's the fact that for the U.S., it's a lot more centrally controlled post World War Two, so they can use that far more as a lever than they can post World War One. Uh, you would all, you would have to get a lot of people on side to use it as a lever, and it wouldn't be as much of a lever post World War One. So, yes, Britain could. And if Britain's saying, look, we can't defend our empire, we can't do this if we uh, to stay as if we, uh, we sign up to this treaty, so we have to leave it, then it kind of puts the onus on the Americans, and they kind of turn around and go, well, yes, the treaty broke because we didn't want the British to have battle cruisers as a separate squadron. The British wanted this entirely on their own? No, they wanted us to both have equal status. It looks kind of bad in the papers. I haven't capped battleship speeds. Um, tonnage does that to an extent. But the reason I haven't gotten speed caps is because speed caps don't come in in this period. Speed caps are something which come in later. There is going to be something I'm going to draw from a later treaty and a later practice, but I'm not bringing in speed limitations in this point. 12,000 tons would still be low. I'm, I'm, yes, and I, I agree with that, but the thing is, that's what was historically being discussed. So again, I have gone with points which were being discussed. That is the upper limit which was being considered for aircraft carriers. 32,000 tons. I shamelessly have gone for that, and I know that's my own biases coming through, and I'm happy to admit that. It could, You could make the case 30,000 tons. I doubt it would have been 27,000 tons on this criteria. But the upper limit being considered for the other ships is 12,000 tons and 9.2 inch guns. So that's why I'm going with that. Night 6831, I, I realize you're very keen. And I notice you're putting some stats in the chat. That's lovely. But there is going to be a table coming which will have stats for... Each navy is getting their own stats table coming, so you don't have to worry about that too much. So, any questions? Hey, I realize by the current definitions you have in the treaty, the World War II unbuilt lions are technically battle cruisers being able to be built earlier in the 30s equals fun. It is interesting, but actually, I think the more interesting thing is what would likely happen in this scenario. I have been drawing quite heavily from my Equitable Treaty series with this because that come into this, it comes into this a lot. It really does. Uh, it was quite interesting to me because another reason I was personally interested in this was because this was another way to go down with the Equitable Treaty route. This would have been another way to make it an Equitable Treaty. And by Equitable, I mean a treaty which... Everyone gets enough of what they want, and by enough of what I want, I, mean, I don't mean they get there necessarily go away happy going, we won! They get 80% of what they wanted. And enough people get 80% of what they set out to, or rather, instead of getting all that, they get 80% of that and 80% of that, they get happier. I'm glad, I know, and I've worked out the same figures provided in the treaty. But I think that's the thing that's going to... And there's some really interesting stats in the treaty which are going to cause fun. Uh, I, Michael Cooch, I have actually something else which I think the French and Italians do, so I will be getting into that. Now, this leads to fun, Michael Cooch, as you've already guessed, for the French and the Rage Marina. And I think that... Considering the Rage and Marina are already pursuing the Francisco Caracola class which are 34,000 tons fully loaded, so definitely come in under the, uh, the limitations for the uh, treaty and the battleships. 28 knots and fast battleships, they're not pursuing the battlecruiser route. I have a feeling the Italians might ask to convert their battlecruiser tonnage 
into capital ship tonnage. And I could see that being allowed. I could see that being allowed. Because that would make sense for them. And also, for if you consider for Britain and America, that's one less threat they have to worry about. So it doesn't matter to them with the Rage of Marina uh, if they are all battleships. Because they're in the Mediterranean. They're A, the British problem, and for the British, they control Alexandria and the Suez Canal. They control Gibraltar. The Italian battleships are going to be, it could be annoying, but they're not going to get anywhere. And ultimately, the British will outnumber them massively. So, I think the Italians go the fast battleship route. And potentially, we'll talk, be talking about the Francisco Caracolas later. This then presents a problem for the Marine Nationale. Okay, the Marine Nationale really would like a battle cruiser because that will help them their empire. But as I've said before, the treaty is the biggest strategic failure of the Marine Nationale of the French in well in the interwar years. Why? Because the moment you accept parity of the Italians, who are your biggest strategic threat and the ones you most worry about, it ties your naval forces to the Mediterranean because their forces are in the Mediterranean. Which means you can't defend the rest of your empire. And at this point, battle cruisers are not as advanced, as useful in the Mediterranean as fast battleships, and that's what the Italians are building. So I think the raid and the Marine Nationale have to go down the same route. The French will have to go down the same route of sacrificing the ability to have battle cruisers in and get battleships. Now the other uh, to get battleships. Now the other option is they go down the carrier route and they get the 2.2, which is possible. It is possible. But I doubt it. I think they go... I think they end up going... The, 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 the combine it to, into the battleship... Uh, battle cruiser figure. Into the, into the battleship figure. And the precedent, of course, of this, for this is the London Treaty, where the British go, we would like to add some of our heavy cruiser tonnage to our light cruiser tonnage. And move our tonnages around. It's not something which is unknown, and for both those nations it makes sense. If you also consider that under this scenario, the Japanese are going to have nine battleships, plus three, well in tonnage terms, you've got nine battleships and three battle cruisers. So they have 12 ships. The most the, ja the French and the Rage of Marina can get out of these is eight decent ships. So they're still going to have less battleships than the Japanese have and not have any battle cruisers. So the Japanese are probably going to be annoyed by it, but not so worried about it, and probably going to consider those two cancelling each other out. And for the Royal Navy and the US Navy, well, they're going to have the allocation of 15 battleships and five battle cruisers. So again, why are they going to care about nations which have eight battle cruisers, eight battleships? So that's my scenario, and well, what do you think? Does it make sense going down this route? Because for me, the Italians asking to go the battle cruiser route uh, would make not make any sense. But going the battleship route, that for them is completely straight out of their their ballywack because they're already building ships which fit within the criteria, which fit within the the, the treaty limits. I don't think you scrap Repulse and Renown. I, you're not going to be able to scrap them because they're too late. There are ships you can scrap, but they're all the 13 and a half inch generation. The 15 inch generation are all basically too new to be able to be scrapped under the treaty limits.
But yeah, you're jumping ahead now to the whole British scenario. We are still at the French Navy and the Rage of Marina. Does this make sense, sort of thing? The Americans aren't going to be happy with it, but they're getting 80% of what they want, so they're going to have to settle for it. The trouble with the Washington Naval Treaty is, honestly, the Americans get too much of what they want. They are too happy with it, and they don't realise they've really caused themselves problems till it gets to World War II, and they realise just how much they managed to at their own pooch. Uh, basically, if you consider this, you have a stronger Royal Navy and a stronger US Navy coming out of it for starters. But you also have a happier Japanese Navy, which might actually breed better relations, or at least short-term better relations. Which could help with other matters. Um... Well, Steve, we're going to get into that, because I would, wouldn't be surprised if Courageous and Glorious are still converted, because honestly, the British want to get rid of them. The only one who's keen on keeping them around is BT, so the fact they are actually survived to be converted is based on that. I'm not sure, uh, uh, but, well, we'll get into the Americans, they're special. So, what we end up with a treaty, if we go with that scenario, looks like this. Battlecruiser category, as outlined... But you'll notice the French and the Italians are no longer part of it. They are no longer part of it at all. The battleship category, as previously outlined, however, the French and the Italians now have 265,000 tons. The aircraft carrier category is left as it was. Now... To be honest, I've given them 1.75, but they could have 74,000... Uh, 74, uh, no, no, I've given them the 2.2, haven't I? Yes, I have. So the 70,400 tons in terms of carrier, design, uh, carrier capability. So, yeah. They'll be strong. They'll be able to build decent carriers under that sort of area. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Marine National and the Rage of Marina could both get probably three fairly good carriers from Mediterranean that gun scenario. And. With. The other ship category I've left as it was in Max. Now, there are some questions appearing in the chat, so. For the French, yeah, they want all. Paul Johnson, can the French convert some battleship tonnage to heavy cruisers? Why would they want to do that? Why would that. How would that help them? Because heavy cruisers aren't going to count to the Italian battleships. That's the problem for the French, the Italian battleships, and the Italians want battleships. The French, the reason they're pushing the heavy cruisers is because the Itali by treaty, the Italians are limited to heavy cruisers, so the Italians pushing the heavy cruisers. The Marine Nationale, as forward-thinking as it is, as clever as it is, is entirely dependent on the reaction of their own politicians, and the politicians are obsessed with what the Italians are building. As they're finding their funding. They are not going to accept less battleships in favour of getting more cru heavy cruisers, or more cruisers. Especially not... And the trouble is the Washington Treaty. There is no... How to, there is no tonnage limit placed on the other ship category. You can build as many ships as you want. That's the thing. The Washington Treaty... London Treaties put tonnage limitation, cumulative tonnage limitations in on cruisers and other ships. In the Washington Treaty, ships below 12,000 tons that have... Eight, have in, well, in, on this war, version of Washington Treaty, it's 12,000 tons and 9.2-inch guns. Historically, it's 10,000 tons and 8-inch guns or below. There is no limit. You can build as many as you want. This is the problem with the county class, really, for me, with the Royal Navy. Because, really, the Royal Navy could have been churning out 8 county class a year quite happily, as far as the treaties were concerned. So, the Royal Navy, 4 county class a year, 8 county class... It doesn't matter. They can churn out as many... They could have replaced their entire cruiser fleet quite happily between 1922 and 1930 with no trouble at all treaty-wise. 
So I need a London Navy and a naval treaty which brings in the cumulative limit to cruisers. So again, there's no advantage by going, yeah, we want to build more cruisers instead of battleships. This treaty doesn't give you any tonnage for that. So it doesn't help you. Nemo, why would the French force the parity with Italy? What are the US and UK to win? The Italians wouldn't sign unless they accepted they were par they had parity with the French. And the French were the most economically weak of all the powers, and they couldn't afford they didn't want to not be a part of it. So the French had to accept it because of that. But the Italian negotiating position the entire time was what do the French want? And we won't accept any less than that. So that's what they did. Yeah, the Royal Navy did plan 40 county class over the uh, over the years 1924 to 1929, but the you, uh, the the government got involved. But they could have built 40 county class, and that would have been really interesting. So there are no cruiser limitation. There's no cumulative limitation on cruisers in this period. In this period, and I'm not adding in. So, any questions up to now? How have we asked? Because we're just about to get into the nations. And we're starting in the nations. And I should warn you, that's a lot of slides. And that's a lot of discussions. Oh, good lord. Leslie Mitchell, did you have to write that in the chat? Oh. Look, it's bad enough that in a video that comes out tomorrow night, I had to look at the Normandy and Lyon classes, okay? Do not have to mention Bern and Aquila. We don't have to do that to me. I like my eyesight. Momo, okay, I just had to Google how many countries the UK actually had to name 40 cruisers, uh, counties the UK actually had to name 40 cru cruisers after. We had enough! Um, we have, play, you know, theoretically. In terms of counties, we have. Mm, Roughly 61 county boroughs and in England and 18 corporate counties, uh, which are, you know, various uh, cities, including the sort of, and we also have, uh, it includes London, etc. Then we have the um, two, eight counties of Northern Ireland. We have all the ones in Scotland and Wales. We could we could get a lot of counties if we wanted and never run out of names. There's a lot of counties, including some very little ones, but you know. It all works. Oh, <laughs> why are you now being cruel? Um, what would be the next non-treaty light cruiser after E-Class if the treaty didn't happen? Ooh, that would possibly have been the 9.2-inch gunship. It would have been... I think the RM were heading in that direction. There are slides. Adrian, although I suspect we won't get HMS Middlesex. Well, maybe we will. This is the RN. We will get it. HMS Middlesex would happen. Amelia Barra, would Italy have built aircraft carriers based on Francisco Carrocola class? I'm not sure. I, Italy might, as traditional, not actually build any aircraft carriers. They might just concentrate on the battleships. That might be well be what happens. They concentrate on the battleships. That is a very strong possibility.
Black Mask Man, with the 12,000 ton and under, how would this apply to Atreus Hermes? Well, that is an interesting thing. That could mean that Hermes isn't part of the carrier tonnage. And there is a reason I haven't done actually done a carrier table for this uh, for tonight's presentation, because of that. Because once you got into the carrier tonnage scenario for the car the carriers, and you started looking at HMS Hermes and others, it made it all interesting, but also made so it made it viable to actually build some carriers under twelve thousand tons. And it could mean that they become quite a big thing, which could mean you end up building bigger carriers if you're the Royal Navy, if you've got enough carriers under 12,000 tons to do other things. So it's an entire spool of thing, a problem, uh, of scenarios. So basically, I focus this in on the likely capital ships and some of the likely outcomes, but I'm not getting into all of the potential ramifications because it goes massively over there. Bell Galactica, steady incremental improvements to the counties over the Calat matches. Well, the counties are a post treaty design. The counties are a post treaty design. But you could have had a. I think you could have had a version of the county class, but it would be 9.2 inch guns. So it would be something like the counties, but it would be bigger and would have had roughly 9.2 inch guns, I think, probably. Judging by some of the ideas they're working on. And, as Knight Sectarian points out, the RM was heading for light and heavy cruisers anyway, as part of a protected armor cruiser that replaced plans. I think you end up with something like the Leander class coming in off the ease probably earlier. I think, without the, tr the treaty issues. Now. We get into... The first of our tables, and I went for the Royal Navy, because the Royal Navy are some of the biggest winners out of this. Now, traditionally, they get rid of their 13 and a half inch gun ships. And here is the first thing. The uh, Tiger is 28 and a half thousand tons in standard, whereas Renown and Repulse are 26 and a half thousand tons. So Renown and Repulse do not take up that much tonnage limitation. They really don't. And you can build roughly three ships under the difference that would be left. Now, what would those ships be? Would they be... Well, you know, what are they going to be? Are they, are they going to be full 42,000 ton ships? I don't think so. They're, you've got roughly 115,800 tons. So let's say... The British go, right, let's divide that into roughly three and work out a class based on that. You end up with roughly 38,000 tonnes per ship. A little bit over. A little bit over. Roughly 38,600 tonnes per ship, arguably. Yeah, 38,600 tonnes per ship. So the British probably aim for something around up to the 38,000 ton mark, but they can build three of them over up until 1930. They have the ability to build three of them. The really interesting thing is the moment you take Hood, Renown, Repulse, and Tiger, or rather Hood, Renown, and Repulse, out of the British capital ship tonnage, along with the 13 and a half inch gunships out of the tonnage, you end up with a massive reduction in tonnage in terms of Britain's capital ship allowance. Oh, good lord. And you end up with roughly 288,750 tons differential. Now, this was an interesting thing for me to work out because I was thinking 37,000 ton ships, that's roughly eight. But let's consider the actual maths. Well, that's 35,000 tons each. 36,000 tons, realistically. So the British could build eight 36,000 ton ships in standard. Think about Nelson and Rodney. Remember, they are 33,500 tons in standard, roughly. Add on two and a half thousand tons, three thousand tons to that. Think about what you can build. 
Also add in that potentially, potentially, the Francisco Caracolas will be completed, which are 28 knot ships. And I think it's very likely you get a 28 knot nail rod. But why am I saying that? Why am I bringing up these points? Why am I discussing all of this? Well, this is why. F3 design, of course, was the battle cruiser design, which was going to be the faster ship versus Nelrod. The F3 was also felt to have a better range of fire, but the Nelrod is more economical and standard and, and standard tonnage. Now, if you have those extra tonnage to play with, an extra two, an extra two and a half thousand tons, you can do an awful lot of things on an extra two and a half thousand tons. You can certainly, you're going to need to get the hull length spacing up anyway. You want the ship to be slightly longer, because that's going to be more efficient at getting you higher speed. So you're going to have the more space at the front anyway, so you might as well do the F arrangement with the guns. Uh, you're going to keep the armor the same, but you're going to at least have a third shaft. And here a third shaft, you can do 28 knots. So we could be talking about 28 knot officially nail rods. Now, if we consider the fact that the 23 knot officially nail rods got to 26 knots, according to the Germans who were being chased by them at the time, um, oof, that becomes interesting. That becomes really interesting. And then we get to the construction plan and the effect of that. Well, you've got roughly three battle crews and eight battleships you can build. The Royal Navy are not going to order them once. They're not going to go, hallelujah, let's order 11 ships. They're not going to do that. That would break the bank. That would be silly. But they can now all go out and order two battleships, then a battle cruiser. You know, I've put down battleships. They could order two battleships each year in 1922, 24, 26, and 28. They could order a battleship, a battle cruiser, in the years 1923, 25, and 27. And they would all be completed in service by 1930. This gives them 11 ships. Not sure why I've got a little bit of an error there, but I will just correct that. It's got, for some reason, 11 years instead of 11 ships. Let me just correct that one. I just noticed that. And don't ask me why my slides have just disappeared. There we go. Pause. Bam, ba -dum, ba -dum, da -da 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 -da. Really doesn't like me playing around with things. Let's get to number 12. Oh, what have you done? Hey, it's back. Now, it could be interesting, but it's workable. And it gives you... It spreads out the ship construction. It allows you to spread out the construction around different yards. It allows you to spread out around different infrastructure. So it's going to maintain a lot more of the British infrastructure than it historically survives. 
which is going to have a big impact on World War Two. It's going to have a massive impact on World War Two. Mel's Ranch, how does the original timeline building holiday fit in this timeline? Well, you see, you have to remember the British were allowed to build ships. This is one of the things. There's this whole, there's going to be a build, about a capital ship building holiday. Well, under this scenario, you can't necessarily have one. So what you have is, you have, I would imagine the British would agree to space out their construction. As they did historically, they agreed to space out their construction and replace ships with it. So I think that's what they would do. And the same would have to go with other powers. You have to go from the original treaty. And instead of having necessarily a holiday as in not building any ships, you have a, oh, you're only going to build the agreed ships in this treaty. So no surprises. No one's going to build anything different. Let's see. We got. Um, uh, uh, Nemo. No, these are not going to be heavy cruisers. Twelve thousand tons does not make them heavy cruisers. Um, they're gonna make them not heavily, a more heavily armed light cruisers. But that's the reality of it, because originally there's no such th there's no such thing as a heavy cruiser in this uh, in this original treaty. In fact, they're basing everything on a light cruiser design, which is the large light cruisers of the Hawkins class. <sighs> Plot and nature of them, and plus you have the. There's not 33,500 tons. They are 32,000 ton aircraft carriers maximum, and we. I haven't gone into that specifics because that's a whole load of extra data, and an extra permutations to go through. So the thing is, this is going to have a good, a positive impact for Britain because also it's going to deal with some of their their job issues. Please note, the Royal Navy is no stranger to. Yes, X yard is cheaper, but B uh, Y yard is in an area which is suffering from greater economic depravity, and therefore because of various issues in that area. So if we um, order from Y yard, that will help the economy in that area, and will therefore give a bonus to it, and also make the government far happier. Expect to see a lot of that happening. The original suggestion of the Anglo-German treaty holiday construction was literally a we are going to, we would build X and you would build Y in that time period etc. Well again I would say if you consider the F3 design again and you scaled it up to well, when we got into the tr when we were, uh, were working through this, if you scale this design, you've got thirty six thousand tons. On this one, you have thirty eight thousand tons. If you remember, the original F three is designed on thirty three thousand tons. So you have another 5,000 tons. You could produce a very interesting design. And also there is the potential that the British going, right, then we can build eight battleships with 16-inch guns. Let's make these the 15-inch 50s. The battle cruisers. And that's going to save even more weight. And we'll see how fast we can get them. So you could end up with some 36-knot battle cruisers. Mancooch, greater economic depravity equals marginal constituency. Um, it can be helpful. Mm. 
Well, again, Moles Revenge, the battle crew, uh, the the Invincibles, etc., already gone. They're not included in any of the treaties. The only battle cruiser which is allowed for, uh, which is included in treaties, which is allowed for scrapping, is HMS Tiger. So I've included Tiger in that figures. But the Invincibles are gone. And again, this does mean, what can the British do? Well, potentially, if you're, if you're having this many ships, it might well be that Australia and New Ze Australia get and New Zealand may, might get the renown and repulse. It might well be, especially if you have six of them under this under scenario. Let's say the British do build the three; they keep the three and Hood and renown and repulse go to Australia, and New Zealand. That could be the option pursued. It spreads out cost. It gives the. It, Australians a replacement for HMS Australia. It gives the uh, it gives the Kiwis uh, a, a new a New Zealand substitute. Remember, New Zealand was an interesting one because they paid for it, but it's pretty much run by it's run by the Royal Navy because they don't have enough naval personnel themselves. So, it's all an interesting point, and actually, it makes sense keeping renown and repulse under those, those circumstances. Excellent. Probably best the best we don't go into carriers, given Enterprise is going to weigh more than historic classics. Well, I will be discussing carriers. I just haven't got tables for them because, frankly, the moment you started including carriers and and tables and started adding on, you were taking this out so many permutations. It was would have turned into a very very long video in the recorded and um and the live. And again, I'm and this is going to sound terrible, but. It again, wasn't feeling that well this week, so I just cut it down and just went, I don't need to. I can come back to that and add that in as a future video if you all want. I can do that as a future video, add in the carriers under this circumstance. Night 6 everyone. There was historically in the Washington Treaty no limits on, cru on, tru on, on cruiser numbers, and still the British didn't replace the nineteen uh, the um, Australian town class light cruisers. So if we gave to historic accuracy, no, they wouldn't. But if you give them renown or a pulse, that might well make a change. It would also probably make a change to whether renown or a pulse get upgraded mid-war more you know renown is is of course upgrade and mod modernized but i think if repulse is let's say a the replacement for hrs new zealand she's more likely to have got modernized no mold revenge the 12 inch ships were scra scrapped because they didn't weren't need any more the uh, because frankly they were considered pointless the 13 and a half inch ships were trapped by treaty Could, would that mean that Repulse would inherit the luck stats of HRS New Zealand if given over to New Zealand? Depends what the name she gets is, etc. Do they rename her? Because that could be both lucky or unlucky. Um, it's an interesting scenario to go into. Which one gets renowned, which one gets Repulse. It's an entire different sort of scenario to go down. But realistically... Realistically... This fits with the Royal Navy's needs. It fits with their criteria. It's not excessive. It's not overly expensive. And also, it's not going to be a problem for the governments to get into. Again, this is not going to be a massive build-up on the British part. And again, this point which says accepting uh, the British may be informally accepting 15-inch guns as the limit for their battle cruisers might be be another thing that set allows the Americans to be happy because the Americans are going to have an issue because potentially the British end up with more 16-inch gunships than them. Now there's two ways this can be resolved and we're going to discuss this when we get to the American part of this, uh, this discussion but it is a very real scenario and a very real problem for them. And something they're going to have to think about. So, any questions?
Steam merchants aren't the RN of disaster. We need four new... Well, again, if you go back to the treaty scenario, the only ones who, under this treaty, are getting new battle... are getting battle cruiser tonnage is the Americans, the Japanese, and the Brits. And the Brits, you could argue, maybe they're a disadvantage, but they can get six... could have, theoretically, have six ships. Six viable ships. And, yeah... They're maybe not necessarily as good, but let's see what the Americans are doing before you start thinking they're at a disadvantage. And the British are getting eight new battleships. So, for the British, eight new battleships, that's kind of useful. The Americans are going to be getting new ships as well, but they aren't getting quite as many as the Brits. Could this put more pressure on the RN to develop high-pressure boilers? It could put more pressure on them to develop high-pressure boilers. It could be they go to that. Most French, I like the idea of you force the IBA command in World War II having renamed Repulse Renown courtesy of the Ran and Arzien. It would be fun. It would be fun. And interesting. Moment for Gersberg. Any chance of other powers building battleships or battlecruisers in this scenario? I doubt it. Honestly, the same scenarios are going to supply. And all this means is that the powers which already have an ongoing program and actually have the cheapest cost to build because of their ongoing infrastructure industry will be able to take advantage of that and build. But the ones who don't traditionally have those things, what are they going to do it? Who out of the rest of the world is going to build a battleship or battlecruiser at this point? If they do, they're going to order it from these other, these powers. That's it. They're going to have to order it from America, Britain, or Japan. And who's going to do it? The, the, are the South American nations going to have another naval race? Probably not. Then who else in the world? Well, if we think they go India, well, India's a British dominion, so that's just, they might get a battleship under the British under the from the British uh, sort of the British treaty system, uh, the treaty the British treaty allocation, but they probably won't. I only give the Australian Navy and New Zealand Navy their advantage because it's a very cheap way for the British of ensuring they have battlecruisers based in the Far East to hand them over to the RAN and the RZN once they've set up the RZN. And remember, they don't come into existence officially till in, during World War II. So I don't think so. Anyone else is going to produce them? Uh, so, anyway, so if it's called a battle cruiser, that means it should be in the front of most things in the line at battle, as scouts. Uh, no, no, that doesn't mean that. It could mean they're out doing reconnaissance, but they won't be at the front of the line. Is there are there a set number of ships allowed or tonnages? Yes, there are. As we went through at the beginning, there are still tonnage allocations. Um, the tonnage limitations are this treaty here, this point here. This is what the sort of the final agreement would be, because I've worked out, I'll talk through the French system, etc. So, Stephen Richards, if you want more discussion of that, go back to earlier in the video. Because I did go into that in some detail. I think. Well, I hope. I hope it was sufficient detail. The Dutch are the only part of people, but they're the nicest way. The reason the Dutch never get that is because of their own political timing. So, frankly, I'm not changing history for that. Um, I have uh, Blackmore Christmas. I don't think it's going to change aircraft procurement. I really don't, because the other fa the factors that affect aircraft procurement are not the size of aircraft carriers. They are what aircraft are uh, what air, uh, what sort of aircraft are being designed. What are the state of air, air of aircraft engines? 
they're in one of the size of aircraft lifts. Those things affect the size of hangars. And if they're bigger, yeah, you might get bigger aircraft, but you might not. It's half a dozen one six the other, and so probably doesn't balance out any different. Most range. Did the treaty not forbid building cavalry ships for other nations? No. The treaty forbid you being able to take into ownership any ships you were building for other nations, and it required you to give information about aforementioned ships that you build to the other treaty powers. You were supposed to still display them publicly just as you were with, supposed to have your own ships. So it didn't forbid it. It's just basically the US Navy was worried about the Royal Navy doing what they did with the... Um, what are so politely called windfall battleships? Agincourt, Cadender, Erin, and Eagle. Yeah, that was nice. And then, by the way, the British did sign up to that treaty promptly. You know, they, they signed up to it. And then promptly World War II begins and the I-Class destroyers. And frankly, if ARA La Argentina hadn't sailed when she'd sailed, she most likely would have been as well. So, yeah. The treaty is worth nothing on that front. Unfortunately, the aircraft carriers aren't going to come before the naval service decision is made. Remember, that's April Fool's Day, 1918. And when they're talking about it post-war and working out what they're going to do, BT is still first sea lord. I'm not changing other areas of history. This is an alternate history. It's, it's actually it's an interesting thing to go and through and look through because it's how it also helps us when we're talking about and I'm going to be talking about this in sort of future naval doctrine development and future predicting the future, sort of strategic futures. The fact is you have to keep as close to the history as possible, so I'm not randomly adding in extra things, and everything I've put in, I've put in because of a reason a reason within the logic of if once you've made one change, it follows on from that change. But I'm not changing the other things of history. I BT still first sea lord. He's still gonna make the same political calculations as the fleet air arm and all the other things. Mancooch, would Russia look to build battleships, battlecruisers? They did historically. They didn't manage to build them. Why? Because their own infrastructure and because they kept shooting their own admirals and engineers. Life happens. So let's look at the Imperial Japanese Navy. Well, they have a small issue, but they have some advantages here. They cannot get the Amagi class on 42,000 tons standard, but they can retain the four Congos. They're allowed 126,000 tons, while the four Congos officially come in at 110,000 tons. So they can keep their four Congos. And they can upgrade them if they want a bit. So frankly, you probably they probably keep the Congos. Now, what does this mean overall? Well, it means, tonnage-wise, they have roughly 140,000 tons for their ability to build, which gives them four roughly 35,000 ton capital ships. So they can build four new capital ships, four new battleships. H. Vern, BT, I don't think, was even first sea lord in April 1st, 1918. Hello, Frank Spinato. We, I did enough to beat you last week. Um, so, the, the Japanese have some interesting things going on here. They don't get necessarily what they want. They don't get the, 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 the 7 to 10 ratio they want. I haven't given them that in this treaty. and I did. That was the whole base of the other Ecuador treaty, that I gave them a 7 to 10 ratio, but still gave the British and Americans a necessary 6 advantage. So, which is why you ended up with 20 capital ships. In this scenario, you, you, you don't get the 7 to 10 ratio still. You still get that three to f 5 to 3 ratio going on. 
But the Japanese get to build four battleships. Now, the question comes, do they complete the two Tosas? Do they try and switch and adapt the key class to 35,000 tons? Do they do something new? I honestly think this is going to be a point of debate and discussion, and it's quite an interesting one to get into, because for the Japanese, all of these options present an advantage. There are only two Tosas being constructed, so they could build those two and then build two new anyway. Something to a combination. They could cancel the Tosas, cancel, uh, you know, and, and do something completely new. They could try and change the key class to being 35,000 tons. Honestly, not sure how they do that, but probably involves deleting something. The four Congos are available in the wait. They already have the Congos in service. So they can retain the Congos and have four battle cruisers. And for their doctrine at a time, that fits. And you can't get risk. The Congos are too new to scrap. This is the main trouble for the Japanese Navy. After the treaty, none of their ships were old enough to be justified scrapping. So they really had to take a building holiday. Which mucked up their industry massively. One of the reasons why you end up the trouble the Yamato class. And it mucks up their national ego and status because they can't build new ships. So they can, the British get to build Nelson and Rodney. The Americans get to complete some ships. The Japanese don't get anything. Well, in this treaty scenario, the Japanese do get to build four capital ships. They get four capital ships. So they can do something with it. What do I think they do? I wouldn't be surprised if... My personal view is they want a fast battleship. Okay? They want a fast battleship. And I wouldn't be surprised if they go the triple turret route. The triple gun turret route. And they might go for a free, free formation of nine 16-inch guns. Why am I saying that? Why am I not going, well, they keep to the twin turrets. They keep to the twin turrets historically, etc., and all these things. Well, if you consider the Yamato class, they don't. And if they can build ships, but they're going to look at it, what's the most efficient turret tonnage-wise for us? And nine 60-inch guns works out well. And again, that's what Nelson and Romney are. I wouldn't be surprised as the Japanese wait for the British to build their first class because that would also give them a time to finish off their existing ships, sort themselves out. They can do that. Also, the fact is it's going to take them time to figure out what exactly they want. I would say the Tosas could end up having a turret deleted and yes and being getting completed it makes a certain amount of sense i would say you're probably in terms of weight saving deleting this turret not this one or this one but again you could do that or you can do as i said a completely new class tempting is definitely is the completely new class and they might well push ahead with the conversion of amagi and eventually Kaga, as they did historically. The earthquake still happens, and they go ahead with those two ships. We don't necessarily save the Japanese economy, but we do potentially alter history quite dramatically, because if they are building these ships, then some of their cruisers will not be able to be built. They don't have the infrastructure to build all those cruisers they do historically as early as they do if they're building four capital ships. It'll also affect their carrier construction, and it will also affect their national opinion of themselves in terms of what they've won. They're building four new ships. They've got that as their national pride. They have got four modern ships, four capable ships. Said so, deleting this one, this turret. Gives them more 16-inch gunships. It gives them more firepower. And as Letzi Mitchell says, they can always 
redesign and lie. They can be creative with the truth. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Because again, look at how everyone was with the treaties. The British with the counties. Their armour is sitting in a warehouse. And we have it available. Um, honestly, the nail rods can only do 23 knots. And yeah, they have water for armour, but we're not telling anyone else that. Um, the Americans with the Lexington Saratoga. I've done this video on the Washington cheaties. And the fact that everyone cheats to an extent. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the, RN, uh, if the IGN did a bit of uh, cheating. Okay, buy a new class, maybe an Amen in the Gato class with Tursa's armor scheme? Potentially. Oh, potentially they could go for a want of something faster. I'm, they're going to be watching what other people are doing. And I think they may be wait. I think their orders would be 19, 24, 25-ish. So they can see what everyone else has done. Japan doesn't have does have the infrastructure to build cruisers. Please not. They don't have the volume of infrastructure to build the cruisers along with the the ships. And the trouble is, if you build those cruisers in the UK yards, you're not going to be able to build them to your specs, which means you're going to have to be honest because the British will be honest about the specs they're supplying you. So you can't lie or be as creative if you build those ships in foreign yards. So the Japanese aren't going to do that. If you delete the super firing turret off, that will save the most weight. Because of the stresses that's going to put on that hull area. Over the shafts and the engines. I think I said that earlier, but not sure. So I said it again. So, any questions about the Japanese? I would also add that whilst the Japanese economy is not necessarily the world's strongest, building four capital ships over an eight-year period is not going to stretch it dramatically when you consider what other things they've built. In fact, it might actually work out as a net neutral compared to historic spending, actually even less. So, yeah. Right, what could you give a brief explanation as to what happened to all the infrastructure and manpower behind building of these battleships and armor and guns? Where did the builders go after? Well, historically what happens is the shipyards focus in on what's building. Uh, people retire. Uh, people die. People go after new work. They go into other industries because welders are useful in all sorts of things. Riveters and people who are used to fabricating things are useful in all sorts of industries, so they go away. And that that's what happens in all industries if you're not investing in them if not you're not using them then people aren't going to be employed on them and if people aren't employed them, they'll go off and do something else and then when you want to re uh, want to use that in industry again well you either have to pay a lot of money for those people to come back because they might have moved they might have set up completely new lives based around the industries they now work in or you have to train up entirely new people which means you have a learning curve it's great fun and costly This is why it's cheaper to build ships when you're already building them. So for Britain, building Nelson and Rodney, they are as che the cheapest point they're ever going to be built is because they're being built then. And that's why then when you look at the sort of the cost inflation differential between their prices and the prices for the King George V's, so going, well, hang on, inflation hasn't gone up that much. Either. No, it's because skills need to be built. Entire armor foundries, which were left sort of weren't being used and were partially shut down or gone completely have to be reopened all sorts of costs are should be added onto the king george v program which aren't officially on there because they need to restart industry whereas if you've had a constant flow of construction you'll have kept that industry going far better you'll have still kept the production going for the battle uh, the battleship guns it would have changed completely the king george v's guns because again if you've been building that many 16-inch guns in that long a time, 
the odds are the well, uh, the, the odds are you go with 16 inch guns again for your battle uh, again if they have included 15 inch guns as a criteria limitation for bat uh, for battle cruisers for some reason and the, the, the Americans have shot themselves in the foot with that one which I don't think they would have done then the British would have a 15 inch 50 gun in service because that's what they were developing and that's what they had uh, they considered for the F3 design a 15 inch 50 so imagine if all the Queen Elizabeth class Hood Repulse Renown have been upgraded to 15 inch 50 cals the enhanced, improved 15-inch 42 turned into a 15-inch 50. That's a frigging scary gun. That's a gun which, thankfully for naval history, only ever marched on paper. Because if that had been in service in World War II, we could have seen things being very interesting. See, Clark, do we see an expansion in infrastructure possibility? Not really, but it's not going to collapse as much, and that's going to be just as important. The British infrastructure, if you consider what it was prior to World War One and during World War One, versus what it was in the 1936-37 when the British start placing orders to grow up their infrastructure for World War II, it shrunk massively because of the lack of construction going on. Whereas if the construction's been going on until 1930, and possibly... Under the London Treaty, you get some more construction enabled because they've kept a constant pace of construction going and you're going to have to have some anyway because you're going to have to start replacing things like the R-Class, etc. as you did historically. Eh, th that infrastructure industry is going to be in a far better position. You're going to... The Marish Maritime Industry is going to be nowhere near as low as it's fallen, historically. Would this affect the amateur design? Well, we'll get into that, but uh, in later. Lombo, just confirm, we're not discussing about the future 1930s designs, we're just the post of new washing. Yes. We're talking about that sort of designs. We will, I will be getting into the broader effects of generally later, but honestly, until you, if you consider the Royal Navy, if we go back to this one, the Royal Navy could honestly be building four distinct generations of battleships because if you consider by the time they are ordering the next generation of battleships, they'll be in service. The previous generation will be in service. So it could be a complete generation ga a gap. It could be a half a generation gap. So each and these are going to be four two-ship classes with three battle cruisers built in between them. That's going to be an evolution of design. I think they start from something sort of a combination of these two, i.e. a 28 knot nail rod design, possibly in an F3 layout, but with nail rod armor configuration, etc. And 16 inch guns. <laughs> Who knows where they end up? But you would not be talking about... And Nail Rods, Nelson and Rodney would be your first two ships in that scenario. But who knows what ships we'd be talking about by 1928. Let's be honest, those battleships would be frigating scary. Because that's your fourth iteration on, the battleship on that battleship design. Your seventh construction, process, uh, uh, constru construction line. That's going to be a developed design. And it's the same with the IGN, because what they might do is they might build a and build one, then build another one, then build another one, and then build another one. They might build one every two years. They might split it up like the British and build individual one-ship classes. So 1922 order one, 1924 order one, 1926 order one, 1928 order one. And loosely have the same class, but then that frees up other yards for doing cruiser work. Magnus Maxus, how does it affect Hosho? Not a drop. Let's see, my great granddad moved to London and became a teacher after Palmer's closed. Exactly. Some went to the USA, some went to the Car uh, Can uh, some went to USA so via Canada for uh, from Palmer's. Yeah, there's lots of places to yards uh, yard staff go. 
Black Man Wrestlers. Why did the IGN convert Kaga and not one of the other Amagi class, like Atago and Taiko, when after Amagi was damaged uh, during the earthquake? Because Atago and Taiko were even f were not as far along and actually further along in terms of being dismantled. See, if all this happened, the man, the moustache is knackered. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into that at a certain point, but honestly, um, the scenario for Germany just becomes worse because you have to remember their tree, their, their, their infrastructure, maritime infrastructure, has been snookered and in many ways um, neutered by the Treaty of Versailles. They're in a big problem in that scenario. I'd say the nicest way to 9.2 inch gun, 12,000 ton cruisers actually potentially put a snookering on the Deutschland class being in any way, shape, or form a viable option. <sighs> Same Richards, I don't think the Japanese are going to keep the Congos around if the RNUSN have 16 inch, bat have 16 inch battle cruisers. Well, they can't not keep them around because that's what they're confined to by treaties. But the thing is, they've got those ships. They are within the treaty, and they're required. That those are the treaty available ships, so they can't get new ships. They're not old enough. They're not old enough to be replaced. But they are able to build four battleships, so they can build four fast battleships if they want. And then later on, the Congos might be replaced or upgraded as they were historically. In the 1930s, I could see the Japanese doing a lot of work on those Congos, a lot of lies being told. One by one, would like this. Would like to say this: the Japanese Type 10 tank is being produced one and one a year to avoid the exact problem of losing the industry. Exactly, it's the same reason why the Americans keep churning out Abrahams to maintain their industry. Industry. Despite them wanting to design new tanks and all those things, they don't want to stop producing anything because you'll lose the industry. It's a problem Britain is having. Peter Davison. Instead of building eight battleships in the 1920s, what happens to two or 1924 and two in 1928? Uh, then Britain don't get them because of the London Naval Treaty. So, Peter Dawson, they're being ordered before 1930. There's the reason why the British rush toward Nelson and Rodney when they do. And also, that's going to be a lot cheaper if you're building those ships in that scenario. For the British, if you build under this scenario, you're going to get the cheapest ships because you're going to keep up that flow through the infrastructure. So you're going to have armor orders going in every year, that large armor orders to the, ar uh, to the armor foundries. You're going to have big gun orders going into the gun foundries every year. You're going to have the shipyards are, you know, competing for these orders and they're being work in key shipyards every year. The engine manufacturers are going to be getting key work every year. It's a constant process, especially when you add in, you know, the work you're going to be doing to your existing ships to maintain and upgrade them. You suddenly are keeping your infrastructure industry going far better and things are going to be far cheaper than if you decide to take holidays in your construction. We are at this point in the moment. Take care, Stephen Richards. Good luck for walking. I'm saying sorry, everyone. Is it accurate to say 12,000 ton 9.2 inch gun limit is going to mean Pensacola class is going to be a good ship? They could be different, but if they're still built to the reconnaissance standards, they're going to be very good reconnaissance cruisers, not good fighting cruisers. How does this affect IGN light cruiser and destroy development? Um, honestly, if they're able to build more capital ships, they might be less desiring about making their destroyers and cruisers so, um, so, how do I put this, top heavy. Um, Geoguy, Congo carry conversion. Why again? Why are you converting the Congos? Why? What is... The, the, the point I think you're focusing in on is that these are 26,500 ton ships uh, and that they're therefore, they are not as big. Or well, 27,500 ton ships. 
They're not as big as their um, counterparts. But the thing is, they fill the role for the Japanese that what they want them to do. And what they want them to do is cause maximum trouble. They want them as reconnaissance assets. They want them as forward support assets. They don't want them to go out and fighting the Ita uh, American battle cruisers. That's, you know, as a sort of toe-to-toe -to -toe scenario. But still, actually, the Congos are fairly good because they are battle cruisers in their design rather than battle cruisers. So they're actually at an advantage versus a Lexington class in that scenario. Lexington class has 16-inch guns. The Congo has 14-inch. But the Congo has, let's be honest, the armour on Lexington class is not going to stand up that well to a 14-inch shell. Congos doesn't stand up well, uh, that well to a 16-inch shell. They're both glass cannons. So in the nicest way, you might as well have the, 14, uh, the Congos because it allows you four ships versus if you suddenly try and you know get rid of them what do you get you can replace them with a bigger ship yay but you can only get three of them so you go from having four ships versus the american five to three ships versus the american five and you have to build uh, build them and pay for all that extra infrastructure in industry And you also break the treaty, because the Congos are not old enough to justify scrapping or replacing. Historically, or in, 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 sort of in the scenario. So it, that doesn't really happen. Okay, Marine Nationale. Next slide is where it gets into full interesting. So, I have 265,000 tons. Kondorek, Didro, and Voltaire are all pre-dreadnoughts, and that's me being polite about them, okay? I'm going to go with pre-dreadnoughts. Corbet, Jean-Bart, France, Paris, Provence, Lorraine, and Bretagne are their, for want of a better phrase, dreadnoughts. They are, theoretically, have the ability to put 33,500 tons for each of the three ships. They can build three ships, 33,500 tons. That's their criteria. Um, very sorry, what nation was the worst affected in the submarines due to naval treaties? Well, the British had been building up not just the world's largest submarine arm but probably the world's most technologically advanced submarine arm and then they have the london treaties come through and they stop they they um, aren't able to invest or build as many as they had been but honestly no one was at the treaty limit so they could all build no one's really affected badly by the treaties for now for summer uh, for submarine design No, no, so the UK doesn't have 9.2 inch gun. The British are going to set the gun size limit at 10 inch to see if the Yanks fall for it. No, they wouldn't do that. Uh, there was a whole debate about it, and it could have been ended up being 10 inch, but honestly, the Americans are going to push it to be the smallest they can. The British... The only reason it's rounded up to... The Americans try and push it at some points for 7.5 inch guns, because that's what the British have on the Hawkins class, and that's the basis. That are using, and it's the British and the French who really push it for eight inch. So yeah, the the Americans would like them to be quite small for the cruiser guns. They wanted a real big difference between them and the cruisers. Now, what was the worst effect that the treaties had on anyone's destroyer designs? That's the Japanese top heavy destroyers. Honestly, they are really, really destroy. Really, really sad. Sigla, I can't see the US Congress actually paying for five Lexingons. I'll be explaining that in a second, but I actually do think they keep with Lexingons. But there's a reason for that, because they've already paid for it, basically. So. So. the French. The thing is, of all their battleship designs post-Dreadnought, the ones I actually like the most are the Leons. So this is really hard for me to say. But what needs to happen 
what we would hope would happen with the treaty tonnage limit of 33 and a half thousand tons is someone would uh, well no the treaty limit's 37,000 tons but they they've got available 33 and a half thousand tons three of them is you would hope that someone takes out the french design bureau and does nasty things to them and basically tells them they have to go back to the drawing board and redesign because 13.4 inch guns even 16 of them in a Leon is not a problem for something like a Francisco Caracola. Now, the thing is, they have six battleships up there. If they can get three more, they will have nine battleships. If they can get three fast battleships, they are in a fairly good scenario. But again, they're kind of trapped by the fact their ships are officially new, even if they're terrible. If they do have to go with a Leon class, if they do decide to continue the Leons, because I'm hoping against hope they cancel the Normandies. No one should complete the Normandies. So I'm going to keep with the Leons. Because if any, if they kept with it, if they, if they, I, I just, no, no. The Leons are, in terms of full displacement, are 29,600 tons. So they could theoretically get all four in under the hundred and fa uh, the roughly hundred and one a hundred thousand five hundred ton limit they're supposed to have. They can possibly, because they are 29,600 tons, full. Uh, you know, their displacements range from 27 to 29,000 tons. Uh, they were supposed to be 21 Nocto ships. So they would have a, a full 21 knot battle fleet. Which would be slow. They could also just not build anything. That is the, the fact that the French did have the option to not build anything. The French could have just not built anything. And I for one would not be upset with that. Because what I think the French need to do is take time to think, contemplate. Get rid of whoever in the design bureau is so attracted to this sort of... The, the, the Normandy class and come back with the Dunkirks or something similar under this scenario though, you could end up some some very interesting Dunkirks some very interesting Dunkirks as Steve Clark's pointed that's three pl Dunkirks plus in tonnage and available yeah I have a feeling <clears throat> I have a feeling that the French do actually build something in this scenario because everyone else is going to be building something. So national pride is going to require them to build something. I just... I just am scared about what it might be. I honestly am. Guys, we're certainly to feel wine until they break down and great. Uh, <laughs> oh, sh I, Honestly... Look... The reason why the French are quite so attracted to the 13.4-inch gun is because of their own limitations in their own infrastructure of construction. So there's part of me which hopes maybe they just go to the Brits and they go, can we have the 16-inch gun design or the 15-inch gun design if the British are producing them? Or maybe they go to the Americans. I don't really care who they go to. I just wish they'd get a better gun because their battleships deserve it. Because basically they're compensating for the capabilities of their gun by putting as many of them as they can in their ship and limiting limiting it to 21 knots. And the trouble is, if their battle fleet is 21 knots and the Francisco Caracolas are 28 knots, their battle fleet is going to get eaten for breakfast. Basically the Caracolas are just going to orbit around them going, Hello! We've got a 7 knot speed advantage. We have 8 15 inch guns, and we are just going to pummel you from range when we want to, how we want to, where we want to. And it doesn't matter what you have in terms of your force. You can keep driving at us, but then you're going to drive back into the rest of our battle fleet, and by that point, you're going to be massacred. So the French really need to have a fast battleship design. They really need it.
Now, the question that came out is, would the Dunkirk's EME builders originally designed? I think they'd be modified ships. They might be closer to a Rikalu. If we consider the Dunkirk's, and I do have their fa my fact sheet on Dunkirk's somewhere around here. ba ba dum -bing. So, the Dunkirk's are armed with 13-inch guns, which is even more distressing. They have eight of them, and they displace 26,500 tons in standard. The, the, the thing is, if you decide to um, uh, push that up, if you decide to go to sort of a Riculu level, well, the Riculus were as sort of completed and as built are, you know, post-treaty are 37,000 tons in standard. I think you could build a very interesting and effective Riculu equivalent with 15-inch guns on... On 33-ish thousand tons standard in the 1920s and 30s. I think you could do it. It would be highly intriguing. But if you consider that their top speed is 32 knots. If you drop the speed down to tw or the speed down requirement down to 28 knots or 29 knots. You could probably get that vessel in at 33,000 tons because of the changes you'd make to the hull, etc. Now, I'm getting quite a lot of questions about the Francisco Caracolo class. And... That's because this is going to be a big thing to get into. And they, and they think like they could almost get a fifth or inch gun from Vegas. Well, I would you say that? I am doing the funny voices. And I do love the fact that I can do that myself. The way would you say that? With a 14 inch gun. But, you know, hey ho. Um. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just it. So the Regia Marina. Well, the Regia Marina are interesting because they have 152,000 tons in terms of difference. And this is where it becomes incredibly interesting. Because the lovely, the one, the only Francisco Caracola class. Probably one of my favourite and most interesting designs. Would A, more than likely be completed potentially first, but we're coming along. Were 34,000 tonnes fully loaded. And if we consider, if you divide the 150,000 tonnes that they've got, they actually have... More than 37,000 tons per ship. In fact, you could do 530,000 tons standard load. And the thing is, we don't have the standard displacement for the Francisco Caracolas. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's not far off 30,000 tons. They could also increase their displacement and increase them and work on them and upgrade them if they wanted. But the thing is, they theoretically, if they're building four ships, out of 150,000 tons, well, you actually have, theoretically, a lot more. You theoretically have a budget of 39... No, it's, it's that's twelve thousand. So it's three thousand. Uh, theoretically, forty thousand. Uh, not quite forty thousand tons. Um, it's forty thousand tons minus thirty-eight thousand tons. 
I will miss, yeah, 38,000 tons per ship. So they could build four 37,000 ton ships. The reason they can do this is because they can get rid of the Dante Alighieri. Unlike the poor French, uh, they did start early enough, and some of their ships were launched early enough, they can actually retire them. So, yeah. The big winners out of this treaty are the Italians in many, many ways. The Royal Navy is probably the biggest winner in terms of numbers of ships able to be built. The Americans are biggest winners in terms of they basically neuter any uh, any threat and get uh, any threat to them, and that either imagined or real. And the Italians are the biggest winners because they get to build what they want. Now, originally, historically, there are four Francisco Caracolas being ordered, and I don't think the the the, the Italians really change them. Their economy is not in such a state that they necessarily want to. I don't think they even modified them to 16-inch gun ships. I think they complete the Francisco Caracola, Marcantonio Colonna, Cristoforo Colombo, and Francisco Morosini as they are. That is my view, because they're good enough as they are. They are powerful enough to beat the French. They are fast enough to beat the French. You can slow walk and slow produce those. The plan being to eventually build using the remaining tonnage and that would leave them with 140,000 145,000 tons if these are 30,000 tons in standard roughly 30,000 tons in standard that would leave them with 145,000 tons to build even if they're 31,000 tons in standard that leaves them with 141,000 tons so they can build four 37,000 ton a maximum limit ships for their next generation that's the long-term treaty goal. That's how they... They don't... You know... Their Littorios are... Well, whatever the Littorio class comes in... Will be 30... I mean... Officially... 37,000 tons in standard configuration... And... Would be a successor to these. So they could well up with... Four 15-inch and four 16-inch gunships... That are going into World War Two. And what they do have... Is a lot faster fleet. A lot more capable fleet. Uh, so basically the greatest loss of potential battleships since the small troop boiler QEs. Yeah. Take care, Amelia Barrow. Run on. Um, yeah. Oh, Run on saying bye. And Blackman West. Would it be good for the Italians to base, not convert an aircraft carrier on their Francisco Caracola hull? It would be. And it's perfectly possible. I don't know if they do. I don't think they do under this scenario. I still don't. The nicest way, the problem for the Italians is always, why do you need an aircraft carrying the Mediterranean when you're in, in range of land-based air and land-based air support? And the it's the Rage Aeronautica really being against it. And it's a real problem. So that's the reason the Italians don't develop an aircraft carrier. Not because they couldn't build one. It could have been absolutely terrible, judging by the Aquila, because they... Look at the French and the German ideas for aircraft carriers and go, that's a really cool idea. Let's copy that. Instead of going, hang on. Who else is operating aircraft carriers? How are they doing it? But, um... Also, there's the thing is, Italy is bankrupt. Italy is not necessarily as bankrupt as it's always often marketed as. It does have steep economic problems. But the thing is, if they had the allowance and they could wind up the French, they would have found the money. Because they look at the, their cruiser program, look at all the ships they find. If they can wind up the French, they will pay the money. They have spent in World War One a massive amount on fighting the Austrians. It was absolutely obscene. Sorry, just dealing with a little moth which is deciding to... Got it. Uh, chase after my books and it's not going to survive they come in occasionally not sure how they quite get in here probably when the door or window is open but they don't survive long 
hope the painting's going well, something covered. Now, the thing is, yes, the British will respond, but this is the point. If the, if the Italians are completing the Francisco Caracalla, and this is one of the interesting things when people go, oh, yeah, the British, the, the you know, the, the, the holiday, why do they want the holiday, etc. Well, to the extent that the British, the, one of the advantages the British get from the treaties, and this is something which shouldn't be necessarily forgotten, is this class is cancelled. So this is a disadvantage for the British that this is actually going to be completed. The British, this is a small problem for the British. But that is definitely going to affect, and it's one of the reasons that pushes the F3 design and makes them attractive, is the British thinking that the uh, uh, there was some discussion as to whether or not the Italians were actually going to get to complete one of these. If the Italians are building all four, completing all four of these, and they can take their time, you know, they can they can spread out the the payments, the cost, etc. of the four of them. They get a very good ship. They get a fast battle line, which can really cause trouble for the French. And the British will have to respond. This is I could honestly see, especially if one of these enter if the Caracola actually managed to enter service. And remember, she's launched. That picture is of her being launched. I could honestly see, especially the Americans, naming all post dreadnoughts, if they're naming for twenty eight knot speed for the battleships, being trying to go, well, yes, we're now into the Caracola battleship era to uh, basically undermine the British because these will be the new bear precedent for the fast the fast battleship which is coming in the 28 knot battleship it's going to be the Caracolas they got there first that's going to be an interesting thing to see but it, it could be you could end up we could have a modern phraseology be talking about how we are post -world, World War One. We're talking about dreadnought battleships. World War Two. We're talking about Caracola battleships, pre and post Caracolas. <sighs> My God, they have a very potent fleet, but would they be able to secure the oil to use it? Well, that is an entirely different concept and is an entirely different issue, but it's potential. They could do. They could do. Uh, it, in more a case of that's going to depend on their own ability to build up their infrastructure. They could be like Britain and decide to build up their own oil, oil fuel depots and large oil fuel, fuel storage. They might not. That's that's an entirely different area of whether or not they the Italians actually think about logistics and in, in infrastructure. Garris and the Brits. The moth was the rage of aeronautica. Potentially. Potentially. Or, you know, the French equivalent. Neither likes me that much at some point. I'm sure like every other navy looks on at the sea speed by Italian speed by battleship. Well, that's the thing. The, for the Italians, think about this as the luster, the status of having this. They get to build this. They're going to have a status symbol. How does it affect the Italian cruiser design? It's an interesting one because if the Italians have fast battleships and they're actually able to build them, then they might not be as interested in necessarily the heavy cruiser design. They might go for the really fast light cruiser design. Oh, but now I'm interested. High pressure boiler queen levels versus Caracalla. Again, if these are built, then I can see, A, the British battle line is all going to be 28 knots. But also, if you think about refits, the British are going to upgrade the Queen Elizabeth Queen Elizabeth's to getting the 28 knot ships when they're upgrading them in the 1930s. And so that could be really interesting. It could push the R class even further down the priority. You might not even see the Royal Oak upgrade. It might be all the Queen Elizabeth class are getting upgrade. Once they, when they're sort of looking at going, we can upgrade the Queen Elizabeth class to 28 knots. Well, that means we can upgrade them to the existing battle line. So we upgrade them. Because we've then got eight 16-inch battleships, which are 28 knots, and we've got those five Queen Elizabeths. So that's 13 ships, which are, 16, which are capable of 28 knots. And we have the battle cruisers. 
Frank, so let's see, how good was the Italian battleship armor layout? Pretty darn good. Remember, well, the Italians are shamelessly building specialists for the Mediterranean. This is another thing that's often forgotten with them. The Italians understand their strategic reason. The reason they're building battleships, not battle cruisers, is because they're looking and going, we're in the Mediterranean. To get out into the rest of the world, i.e. the areas where we can have room for the maneuver and really utilize the battle cruiser, we have to either go through the Straits of Gibraltar, which means we have to go past the French fleet, who are our number one uh, enemy, and past the British who control the Straits of Gibraltar, or we have to go out to Suez, which is through the British, but is also away from the French, which leaves the Italian coast open to the French. That's not a sensible scenario for them. So you build the fast battleship because that gives you the speed for the strategic maneuverability in the Mediterranean, but also gives you the armor when you get so caught and you have to do a solid fighting, you have the ability to fight and take a pounding and deliver one. So this is why the fast battleship suits the Italians so much. And you only have to look at the Latorios, which in many ways do build on the Francisco Caracalla class and their legacies. To think, well, what would have happened if you actually have the Francisco Caracolas class in service? You know, honestly, the equivalent of Torios, which could well still be built, because you've got the same people in power making those decisions on namings, would be that much better. And the Latorio class, as I, was, I often say, are pound for pound the best battleship the Axis fleets have in World War II. But one of the reasons they are the best is because they are shamelessly focused on the Mediterranean, and that's where they fight. If you'd been taking them into the North Sea or the Pacific, you'd soon see issues with their design versus others in their roles. But the thing is, in the Mediterranean, they are really, really good. And it's the same with Francisco Caracalla. You only have to look at this shape of this design, the profile of its hull, to know this is a Mediterranean-focused vessel. Black Maximus. The idea of the Italians having built an era of fast battleships would make them gleefully rub in France's face. Again, France doesn't really get anything in this scenario. France is still probably in trouble, and I doubt they actually do build anything, because let's be honest, they basically use the treaty as an excuse not to build anything for about 20 years. So, yeah. Chris Shane, scary. 28 not 1550 war spike. Yes, well, see, I would say the British agreeing to maybe a 15-inch gun limitation for their uh, their battle cruisers, or maybe keeping to it just as a way of, um, um, how do I put this politely, incentivizing the Americans to it. It's a good thing for the British, but it does mean you get upgraded war spite. And sad arc glass noises from Cody 85. First one, did the Italians have less problems with their World War II torpedoes because they never fight outside the area of testament? Bingo. There is an advantage to fighting inside. Now, the Italians do have some issues with their torpedoes from their submarines in the North Atlantic, etc. But it is not as often mostly because by the time uh, because again the italians actually have their navy fairly support well supported fairly well uh, training and testing fairly well around the world for much of the 1920s and 30s they do have areas they're going to and from the italians are fairly well integrated into the global system and wandering all over the place in the 20s and 30s they were allies in world war one and that's not forgotten quickly So lots of people being very sad for France with no money and no manpower. It's true. And it's it's one of the other factors which you have to remember when people talk about the British debts in World War One. The British hadn't been subjected to the bombing campaign they were subjected to in World War Two, And the British had been doing just the same as the Americans in terms of arms supplies to the other allies. So, yeah. That there is... There is some interesting stats going on there once you start looking into the greater economic details. It's um, interesting. There is a reason France is as quite as loyal as they are. What did Italian subs accomplish in World War II? I don't know, man. They did quite a lot of interesting stuff. That's not today's topic, but I will do a video at some point. It's probably about them. 
Okay, oh, how fast can small tube boilers act when you get an upgraded R class? Well, they're starting from a lot slower anyway. The R class are 21 knot ships. Um, yeah, they are 21 knot ships. I'm not 100% sure, but considering their smaller boiler space there, that there's concentration on their boilers and their more narrow space anyway, and their slightly shorter beam to their sort of length to beam ratio, you are probably talking even with upgraded boilers, you're not getting past 25 knots. If you consider for the Queen Lizard class, you're talking about a 4 knot jump to get to 28 knots. From roughly 24 knots to... So you're going up a 6th. For the R class, you'd be going up a 3rd. That's a far bigger jump. So it's not just boilers and turbines, it's pretty much everything you're replacing. And you're going to need to put in more boilers than you would in the equivalent Queen Elizabeth class, and you're starting from that space. So pretty much you are autom probably automatically having to consider converting them into some kind of renowned class, almost in a way, because you're getting rid of a turret and adding in boiler space and a funnel, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's not really helpful. It's better to leave them as they are and use them as second line battleships for other duties. Um, for Linus, do they still have problems with the gun target? It wasn't problems with their targeting, okay? It's not, again, this is one of the things. It's not problems with the, 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 the targeting. The targeting is very good. What's very bad is the quality control, their shells which is what leads to them not hitting the target. When their shells were of good quality, they hit the target at some of the longest ranges quickly and some of the quickest times of any navy in the world. But the trouble is their quality control their shells meant their targeting was as accurate as your targeting is, the, the shell you're firing doesn't go where you're aiming it. Um, yeah, historically that's going to be the same. But there again, if you have the Francisco Caracolas, etc., in service, and they've they got their 15-inch guns, if you keep with 15-inch guns and don't go to a 16-inch gunner for your Latorio equivalents, you could well be talking a far more experienced design if you've got far more of a pool of 15-inch shells and you've been testing it out for longer, so you might have eliminated some of those quality control issues. And the Francisco Caracolas might be given upgrades as well. Tiglock, so, if you replace the stern with a transistor, could you get more speed on the Queen Elizabeth from Revenge classes? Potentially, but there's also a reason the British don't do that, because of some of the other stability issues. And, again, do you really need to? You don't need to, to get 28 knots for the Queen Elizabeth class. And that's going to be the new entry level point. All right, so we've done the British, we've done the Japanese, we've done the French, we've done the Italians. It's the US Navy time now. Now, this is always the interesting one because the US Navy, mainly out of the Washington Treaty, get to complete three of the four Colorados. Under this treaty, I could see them getting to complete the fourth Colorado, a USS Washington. Now, the reason I can see them doing that is because I don't see Congress wanting to order new ships. I could also see them getting five of the six Lexington class completed as battle cruisers. Because, again, they don't want to order new ships and they're going to claim they're all 42,000 tons. The easiest things for them to do is just build them. Just build the ships they've already ordered for and already paid. Again, they've already paid the money towards these ships. 
They have to cancel their building, cancel their pay schedule, and sell them off for scrap to try and recoup some of the money. But they've already paid for all those ships. So they don't need to get new monies. They don't need to vote new monies. They don't need to have a new debate or new vote. They can get those. And that does give them nine 16-inch gun ships. Very quickly. They're going to have them pretty much before the British have theirs. The British are going to take an age to get their 11, uh, get up their 11. It's not going to be to the end of the decade. The, the Americans can get theirs quickly. They will have nine 16 inch gun ships before anyone else. They will have more 16 inch gun ships than anyone else for a long time. There is a small problem in that they are eventually going to be less ships in terms of 16 inch gunships than the Brits, but I'm going to get into that point in the next slide. With the US aircraft carriers though, the problem is that if you have Washington as a capital, as a, as a completed as a Colorado, and you have all but USS United States, or it's America or the United States? Lexington class. I think it's the United States. He says he thinks it's in the United States. You would have all but the United States completed as battle cruisers. Therefore, theoretically, the United States of the Philadelphia Navy sh Naval Shipyard could become your aircraft converted to your aircraft carrier. But the Americans do not now have, under this scenario, two hulls going around to convert into an aircraft carrier. They don't have two hulls going around. They just don't. Thank you, John UK. This is the United States. Around curse the slay the box people. They misled me to do my brew supply. <laughs> That's terrible. Cody, if I honestly I'd send the R's out to come off fleets. That's the other option. Instead of Renowner and Pulse, you send out the R's. But that's if they have the manning and want to do that. Now, for the Americans, the thing is, their battle line is a massive hammer. That is what they've always wanted it to be. It's a massive sledgehammer, and this force would do it. And also, if you have a fourth Colorado, who's really going to complain? That's a good battleship to have in 1920s. This is going to give them, at least in the initial period, a dominant factor in the 1920s. Longer term, into the later, later 1920s, the advantage is going to be with the British because of their number of ships, but we'll, again, we'll be talking about that. Also, the five Lexington-class battlecruisers. Now, we can spend a lot of time slagging them off. They have all sorts of issues, but they are battle cruisers. They really are. They really are battle cruiser designs. They are orientated around economic warfare. They're orientated around scenarios like the Falklands, Battle of the Falklands from World War I, they are, and Battle of Coronel. They are orientated around, in, uh, around information gathering. And realistically, if you add the USS United States as an aircraft carrier version, backing them up, that could really drive a lot of development. I'd also say, if you're limiting tonnage for your aircraft carriers is 32,000 tonnes, then your, car your conversion limit is not going to be 33,000 tonnes. Your conversion limit is going to be, well, historically, it was 6,000 tonnes higher. So your conversion limit for a conversion carrier could be as high as 38,000 tonnes. This is another reason I haven't got into the carrier debate and haven't got into the wider carrier discussion, because it is an entire different, it's an entire another thing to get into what the carriers happens in this scenario. And yes, you have the Constitution, Ranger, Saratoga, Constellation, and Lexington. This scenario. This is not necessarily the greatest names for running for lo loss, but you know to lose. But you know they could be useful. Now, you, why the question is going to be, why would you sacrifice one of these ships for another carrier? 
And especially remember this point. We are talking about 1922. The value of the carrier is not yet known. The value of the carrier has not yet been proved. The value of the carrier is theoretical. It's something the British are working on, but the British are in many ways pushing towards, which other nations are slowly going into. So why would the Americans want to make that leap? They're not going to. They know battle cruisers. They know their value. They know what the Lexington class are designed for. They fit with the rest of the standard battle fleet. They fit with their doctrine. They are these far ships designed to scout and find the path for these ships, the battle fleet, the mighty sledgehammer of the US Navy to find the enemy and smash them. And if you look at this scenario, the US Navy has the four Colorados. And then it has not just that, um, so eight ships? No. It doesn't have 12 capital ships. It doesn't even have 16. It has 18 battleships. 18. Well, they can put 14 of those and the far and let's say four out of five of the Lexingtons on the Pacific coast. And they can still maintain a decent-sized battle group in the Atlantic for their... We honestly need to maintain an Atlantic fleet, despite the fact we have such a close arrangement with the, uh, with the British that our own president's favourite golfing buddy is the British ambassador. I am not going to get into whether the Lexington class will be forward deployed to the Philippines and the Sahina, you know, all these things... There are options. South Dakota class, maybe for conversion. That's an option. But and I don't know if they would go to South Dakotas. Because they might do, but they're not really as far along. They are not in any way, in any way shape, or form in the same position as the Lexingtons to be converted. Um, I think you might end up with the Lexingtons being forward deployed to Hawaii earlier than the battle fleet. You might end up with the Lexingtons being at the battle at Hawaii and the scouting force being at Hawaii rather than the battle fleet. Because remember, the Lexingtons were going to be the core of the scouting force. So you could well deploy them forward, four of them, as the you know the core of the battle with whatever carriers they have as for as for a further forward. But said their nine 16 inch gunships may not be considered enough so they might make the argument that they also get to replace their four eldest dreadnoughts arkansas wyoming florida and utah which would historically remain which would enable them to have three new ships to match the RNs 11 with 12 of their own. That might be well an agreement that they can't do this till 1928. It might be that the British go, yeah, you can do that in 1928 before we start renegotiating the next treaty. I would be intrigued by this idea. I think it's a possibility. I think whatever happens, you have enough construction to keep the yards going, and they could slowly motor through that construction. I don't know how long it keeps them going for, but I could reckon they probably have it all out by 1925-26. Um, Blackburn Maximus is having fun with the idea of what happens to the USS Constitution. If they tried to scrap it, if it gets sunk, all sorts of things. Or the government nuked the Constitution. Yeah, she would have been preserved if she survived. If the USS Constitution, the battle cruiser, survives World War II, she's getting preserved. No one wants to scrap the Constitution or do that. In fact, the only way they did get rid of her was because he's saying, Treaty. We have to get rid of it for the treaty's sake. Um... Most of the armoured and protected cruisers are gone anyway, eventually after the treaty. So the Lexingtons would replace this. That's, that is an advantage. They would have been replaced more quickly. But the thing is, that's not a massive um, 
elephant in the room because lots of navies have armoured and protected crews around. Some of the navies are including pre-dreadnoughts in their battleship tonnage. If we go back to the uh, Italians, there are pre-dreadnoughts in there. Basically, everything below the Dante Alighieri is a pre-dreadnought. If we go to the French, everything below the Corbet is a pre-dreadnought. If you're including... You can't really start making a fuss about the Americans having armoured cruisers still in service when nations are honestly trying to include pre-dreadnoughts in their viable battleship tonnage. So, it becomes an interesting scenario, really. It becomes a fun scenario. What do the Americans do? I... There's part of me which thinks they won't bother much about the 16-inch gunships and they'll just leave it to the 1930 treaty. Or because they might build a uh, believe like they did historically. They didn't think the British would build Nelson and Rodney. They thought the British would never build Nelson and Rodney. So they might believe the British will never max out their construction. Of course, the British historically always maxed out their construction, which is one of the things which went into the 1930 treaty. But... Yeah, it would be um, an interesting scenario. For the Americans, having this kind of force does give them a lot more capability. It gives them some interesting battle groups, especially if the United States is completed as a carrier conversion. Because if you have the USS United States as your carrier conversion, and you have her paired up with the whichever Lexingtons are in the scouting group, then suddenly you have that fast ship carrier task force start to appear. And I think the Americans could get very attached to that idea very quickly. I think, honestly, the Americans could get really, really attached to it. Really, really quickly. So, yeah, I think that has an ing that has a differential. I think that has a big differential. And I wouldn't be surprised if that has an impact on World War II, on some decisions they make. Especially some of their procurement decisions. I think in, the most interesting thing that's going to have an impact is on the Iowa class. What they look like. But it's also going to have an impact on the Japanese. Because if we consider... Well, the Yamato class historically are 27 knot ships. The Lexington class battle cruisers. were 33 knot ships. If the standard battleships, and the standard, you know, the entry level of battleships is 28 knots, you've got British 16 inch battle cruisers going around which could be doing 33, 36 knots, American ones coming around which can do 33 knots, and the average battleship is doing 28 knots. There is no chance that you can aim Yamato class for 27 knots and be, think they're entirely su 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 survivable. The entire scenario for the Japanese was based around beating up American standard battleships, which were, let's be honest, not the fastest things in the world. You know, even the Colorado class, and I do love those. They are lovely looking ships. Even the Colorados, and I'm just pulling up their stats for their way, are um, 21 knot ships. So the American battle line is 21 knots. I think the big problem you have for the Americans is that they have a 21 knot battle line fleet. And everyone else has a 28 knot ship fleet. By the time 1930 brings around. So I have no doubt that the Americans in 1930 definitely are going to be going, We need to build a faster fleet. It's going to be, but There's just going to be, you see, if I if I was good, I'm trying to think of which nation, uh, which of the states within America are the speed demons. Because, you see, if I'm gonna go for the gun focused states, I'm gonna go for my te uh, for Texas. You know, it's the, the 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 USS Texas, and don't mess with Texas as a model, and the fact that the, their sheer affinity seems for large amounts of guns, 
This is based on my own cousins in Texas, please note. So, uh, before anyone goes, you're being rude about you're you're making uh, uh, you know assumptions about America. This is based on my cousins in Texas. I'm basing this on compared to my cousins in Florida, California, and New York. The four states which we have cousins in, who I've met quite recently, again recently. So I, I I do have a relationship with them. I chat with them online, and and we've met in person quite often for years. So I would say Texas are the are the gun relatives. Okay, um, I'm not really sure which state would be the speed. Uh, Detroit. Detroit's coming in, but basically whichever state is the speed focus one. We'll probably have this congressman going. I don't care what you do. I don't care. You gotta fix the speed. You gotta fix the speed. All sorts of weird voices coming through, man. Indiana has the Indianapolis 500. <laughs> states Eastern Mountains and Ridge Runners. Yeah, lots of states could be going, you, you can't have this. This is a 21 knot battle fleet. It's just not worth it. Michigan, Florida, that's... That, 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 yeah, mm. it's the the it it would be fun. Uh, Chris Shea, we scrapped the USS America. Like the USS Constitution, she was scrapped before she was built. There's a different scenario scenario once they're built. Once they're built and in service and being commissioned, there is a very different scenario to scrapping them. And let's be honest, the scrapping the USS America caused the fall of several senior politicians because of the Korean War. Which mm, that's an interesting video to do. That's eventual. Oklahoma is into street racing. Um, still ending up with Ranger Star Carrier. Yes, but it's a Ranger Star Carrier which might be a lot larger because, if you, again, you've got your limitation. It's 32,000 tons. So what are you going to be building a light carrier to? So consequences for the London Treaty. Okay, well, this is an interesting scenario to get into. Um, my main thing and um, is going to be that I don't think they stop the building. I think they have they continue a constant level of building, mainly because the Americans are going to want to replace their slower battle fleet and upgrade that speed. So either they've managed to put the free ships into the Washington Treaty, or they're going to, as part of the London Treaty, want to start replacing their older ships. And they're going to want to start replacing them as soon as they can. And they are coming up for replacement, so it's sort of occasional. Uh, it's a rumor. The British will be quite happy to accept that and probably start working on replacing the R-Class. Conversely, the Queen Elizabeth is unlikely to be upgraded. The R-Class are likely to be replaced. So that could be just that the British could go, yeah, well, we'll do that. We, we need to be able to replace the R's and maybe Renata and Pulse, but maybe not. It's it's going to be how well their cap uh, how well their um thirty three foul uh, thirty their thirty something thousand tons what thirty eight thousand ton if we go back out I just can see my own notes my own notes will click up flick up if I go back to the slide why Alex try and remember your notes when you can flick back and your slide notes will pop up. It just makes life so much easier. So yes, the uh, thirty-eight thousand six hundred ton bat uh, battle cruisers. If they've uh, if uh, if they've been proved quite successful, the British might um, <clears throat> want to build some more. They might want to sort of carry on building that line, and they might even try and negotiate through that they get to build three of them, or something like that, to replace Hood, Renown, and Repulse. Or they might do modifications. They will want to do something with their battle cruisers, but mainly replacing the R class. So that'll be the British infantry. The, the, the Italians, of course, just want to build their next four generation battleships. The French are going to be going, Can we replace our ships? They're terrible. Um, they're not sure what to replace them with. And the Japanese will want to do some new building as well. And Again, this could well change the scenario, because if you have a treaty which allows for a certain level of construction, 
then you're not going to have the Japanese necessarily want to buy a bar in 1937 because they've got what they want to an extent. They're not going to get a revision up to the 710 principle. They're just, it's not going to happen. Um, but the British are going to go, yeah, that's fine. We'd like some construction. I think you'd get that as part. Instead of the naval treaty which goes through, which is almost harsher than the Washington Treaty, I think you end up with a differential. I think you end up with it carrying on. Now, the interesting thing is, we've had a level of construction. No one's broken the rules. Do you therefore continue decide to have the cruiser debate? Do you have because the thing is, the whole reason the treaty limitations come in for cruisers is because there's been a cruiser race going on because they couldn't build capital ships. Yes, because they couldn't build capital ships, there was a cruiser rate race, a cruiser race. So if you don't have a cruiser race going on, because they'll still be able to build capital ships, most of them, uh, do you have the treaty, the, the issues coming with the London tre that come with the London Treaty of the cumulative tonnage different limitations on cruisers and below? The British will probably still want to try and get in a submarine tonnage limitation. That might well take place. But I'm honestly not sure if anyone does a limitation on the ships below cruiser tonnage. Now, the interesting thing is, people have already pointed out, what about light carriers on the tree? Well, that is a factor. Again, best considered in a carrier video. But if we consider HMS Hermes, which is a fairly useful carrier and is a good example to bring up, because she is built as a new first pur uh, purpose built carrier, she is 10, uh, roughly 11,000 tons in standard. Now, if you have a 12,000 ton limitation, you and you can build them, you might well have carried on building, uh, might have built some more, because 10,000 tons is too small, but 12,000 tons you can improve, build an improved Hermes design. So the British might have been building some of them. In which case, you might have something coming to the London Treaty, which limits them. It might be the nations are limited to, well, if we go back again, because I want to be able to see my notes again. To here. You'll notice the tonnage figurations for the capital ships and for the carriers. 160,000 tons for each of them. Now that's based on them getting five carriers. Now let's say you decide to go put in a limitation for the small carriers of 16,000 tons and you're allowed 10 of them. That could come in in the London Treaty. I could see that. A light fleet carrier being up to 16,000 tons, and you're allowed, you know, basically you're allowed 10, 16,000 ton light fleet carriers, or, you know, and five fleet carriers. That works. And again, within a world where people have got so many 15 inch and 16 inch, have got so many 16 inch gun ships coming to service, the odds of someone pushing through an idea for a 14 inch gun King George V's is unlikely to happen because who wants to back down when you've got that many 16 inch gun ships in service in the world? It's all an option. Now, next one, consequences of World War II, capital ships. Now, I've already mentioned the, uh, the, the Deutschland class as, honestly, in a world where there's 9.2 inch gun cruisers going around, their life expectancy is short. In a world where the RN battleships can do 28 knots. There are three new battle cruisers and all the other things around. The Deutschland class are definitely, definitely in trouble. In masses of trouble if they're trying to wander around the world because the British have just that much more deployability and presence. And ability, therefore, to respond to events. But, um, 
Yeah, Sharnos are nicer now. They are fast battleships. They're not battle cruisers, they are fast battleships. They are armed with 11 inch guns because those are the biggest that the Germans have available. Sorry, something's just fallen over on the garden. I'm going to go check what it is because I heard a crack. That was not good. Back in a second. Let's break down my trainer backs. What happened out here? Oh, it's that. So we have a bird feeder stand, which I find an interesting contraction in the first place, which I swear when I eventually get to somewhere where I know it's going to stay long term, is going to get concreted in because what it is is one pole and then it has one supporting spike which is on it. And I think honestly it needs about four supporting spikes or concrete because otherwise it just slowly goes, and then you hear a crack. Just a small one. And that's because it's hitting a tree. Ah, Not bench wars this evening. No. So, pretty much, under this scenario, Sharnhorse and Nisenau are in trouble. They really are. Because again, you have the British having 20 capital ships, uh, well, a lot more than 20 capital ships. They have the 10 R's, you can see, uh, the, the, the 5 R's, the 5 Queen Elizabeth, so that's 10, 15 inch gun battleships. They have Renown Repulse and Hood as 15 inch gun battle, uh, battle cruisers. They have three 16 inch gun battle uh, uh, cruisers, and they have eight battleships, which are 16 inch gun ships. So, you are talking about 18 battleships and six battle cruisers, so that's 24 capital ships on the RN strength. So my view is if, look, if the German Navy were being sensible, the idea of even confronting the British would be not anywhere there. That would not be a sensible scenario for them to push through. But, should they be looking at it, I wouldn't be surprised if they try and push a PCU and offset strategy, which is going to be interesting because if the Germans start cranking out submarines and don't build surface ships, that makes the British problem of dealing with them much easier because the British just crank out escorts and don't have to worry about anything else. If the Germans go for other means of countering it, then they get, you know aircraft carriers probably cranked out if or sort of thinking about aircraft being an option but the other scenario is of course the germans delay their construction and have to invest more in infrastructure before they can actually build anything so they might build more deutschland class considerations those might be the deutschland class that come out might actually be closer to a scharnhorst in terms of uh, scharnhorst in terms of its gun layout but be marketed as Deutschen class, uh, you know, the Deutschen class equivalent. So have nine 11 inch guns, etc. And they might build more of those, but it might be a case that Bismarck and Tirpitz are sort of equ equivalent battleships, are what they produce as their first battleships, and they would be delayed because they don't have the infrastructure to build them when they build these. So there is no point building 11 inch gun battleships in a world where you have that many 16-inch gunships going around, which are 28 knots but fast ships, you just... Yes, you have a speed advantage over them, but you have 11-inch guns. They are all able, capable of doing 28 knots, and it's a lot more of them. 
So you might be ch being chased by two of them, thinking, yes, we're getting away from you, and find yourself facing another four of them coming that your way. Especially if the Queen Elizabeth class have been upgraded. And the British could have anything of up to 13 18, 28 knot chips, and that's if you don't include a London treaty scenario where the R class could be being replaced by new build chips. In which case, God Lord help anyone, because, you know, the DR class, their replacements will certainly outclass you. It's just, the Sharnors class don't make sense in this world. That's a bit interesting. Heavy birds are there. No, no, it's not heavy birds. It's just not my... I love my sister dearly, but I will say this: she ha that bird feeder is designed for, I think, at most three feeders on it. Uh, it's got twelve on it because she re is really worried about the bird. She's read, so she's a very kind and caring person, and she's read almost everything out from the RSPB, uh, RSPB about how the birds are and how trouble they are, and you know how they need to put on you know, wait for winter, etc., and all these things to survive. And the bird feeder, uh, not just that bird feeder, but the the bird table, which we also have up there, which is on top of a steel pole, which is concreted in the ground, I, sw I, I believe are groaning under the weight of the feeders. I mean, she's literally bought extra food, she's bought new feeders, she's put them out there, she's got them dangling from trees. D there are so many feeders around our garden for feeding birds, it's, uh, it's, it's absurd. It's always fun. Granny Wars way. Oh, <coughs> if you think about this again, it, 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 you know, you've got two scenarios. You've either got the British have gone for an all 16 inch gun fleet, or to appease the Americans about the fact that they would have more than them. Having said, said, well, 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 our eight battleships will be our 16 inch gunships. We won't build all of them, our battle cruisers with 16 inch gunships. So we've got to develop the 15 inch 50. For our battle cruisers, and then you know you've rearmed the 15-inch gun, the war spikes and Queen Elizabeth's class with 15-inch 50s and cable 28 knots. It's just there is no scenario in this which is good for the Sharnels class. And that that becomes the problem because I think they try for large-scale ships. But I think you're dealing with the fact that they're that sh that the Bismarck equivalents, which will come into service later than the Shan horse, so might be not coming into service till 1940, 1941, which is pretty much historically when they did do, but that's because of their infrastructure limitations and how long it took them to build up to levels they could build them, are not going to have the Shan horse experience to build from. So that's going to affect them. Now, do the Germans beyond with anything uh, bother with anything beyond the coastal defence force in this scenario? I don't know, but I think, in the nicest way, dictatorships are not often logical. You're dealing with a lot of the re rationale behind the Germans doing what they're doing is their is World War One and their image of themselves in World War One, and having a great fleet is part of that. And a great fleet means battleships. And there's also the fact that if you do just go for submarines or do just go for some one thing or the other you make the british task of defending against that so much easier i nice agreement i agree but in nicest way I'm, that's not an argument that's not a windmill i'm going to successfully um tilt at in the nicest way, there are. Uh, I am prepared to be Don Quixote, and I am prepared to um, be as quixotic as anyone, and give myself over to causes which are lost causes, but still put my effort for them. But that is one which is just beyond me. So I'm just rebuilding stuff as we go. I can see heavier ships being decided not to be worth it for the Germans. But I can also see them still pushing the idea because of their self-image.
Um, Carl goes, but remember, Germany doesn't get any shipbuilding in us. So Germany's still got the Treaty of Versailles, so there is no benefit for tri Germany gets no benefit out of a London, an enhanced London, uh, Washington and London Naval Treaties. They don't get anything on that. So, it's no benefit for... They probably still get it. The interesting thing is going to be the case of the British and Americans and the British suffer the same amount from the Depression as they have the construction going on in terms of Britain, etc. Uh, they might not. They, it will still be bad, but remember your traditional thing, and this is one of the interesting things I noticed when we went for our own uh, mini well, recession not that long ago in 2010, when everyone's talking about austerity, austerity. And you sit there and go, how have we got a part of every other previous recession successfully and quickly? By investment, not austerity. Investment in infrastructure, investment in education, and investment in defense has usually been your methods of getting out of recession. By investing in the things you can, can invest in. Because if you invest in defense, that usually means investing in high technology research, which is usually beneficial. Investing in, re in infrastructure tends to uh, help get the economy going and provide some form of mass employment. And investing in education tends to help, again, the population work its way out of the out of the a recession. Um, that's what you tend to do. But, yeah, that that's, that's forgotten. And, by the way, that was done by very conservative-leaning governments. This is one of the more interesting things that, you know... This is why I I believe that ideology is such a particular issue in modern politics, because a lot of parties have got away from where they were originally because of ideology and where that the logic of ideologies has taken them. But that's a completely different topic and a personal bugbear. Um, I think the reason the Weimar Republic elected Adolf and the reason Adolf came to power is a lot more complicated than just elections. Remember, he doesn't always even win the elections he gets to power after. It's because he's seen as a safe bet to keep away the communists that a lot of the older true power in Germany supports him. So, I don't see that scenario as changing, no matter how, what happens to the economy. Anyway, let's go on to consequences for World War II aircraft carriers. Well, okay, so I wanted to talk about this in rough terms, because getting into precise terms, as said, would be an entire other video because it gets very interesting, especially the light carriers and what might come out of the London Treaty and how that might affect things because you could change things so dramatically that even this is wrong. The British historically wanted a six carrier fleet carrier minimum. This is what led them having 23,000 tons or 22,500 tons as their de facto um, ceiling. Spelt supposed to be spelt C E I C E I L I N G, not sealing. Um, well, that's great. I recorded this the long patrol for Saturday already. I'm not changing it for that word because don't take this. Uh, this is going to sound terrible, but I've had enough trouble getting videos recorded this week because not being well, and I've got a busy day tomorrow. So, yeah. Let's do this for a second. Um, properties. Yay. So, if you have the maximum tonnage of 160,000 tonnes, that becomes 26,500 tonnes in standard. Which allows the RN to build up, air to build every carrier from HMS Arc Royal onwards as pretty much implacable class equivalents. Which is interesting. 
in the US Navy terms, because they don't care, and they're looking at 32, they could be looking at 32,000 tons in standard. And let's think about what 32,000 tons in standard equals. Now, if we think about it, a Midway class, when it's built, is 46,000 tons in standard. The Essex class are roughly 31,300 tons in standard. So, you could be building Essex class equivalents from the get-go. The Yorktown class are 20,100 tons in standard. So, think about that. Think about a US Navy which has a large carrier, and that it could well have the converted USS United States as its large carrier operating with battlecruisers, providing an idea for what a fast carrier battlecruiser task group can do. And then think about the Americans having 32,000 tons standard displacement as the limitation of their construction. And think about them building three or four of those. It's even more interesting when you start to consider the WASP class, because you sort of go, well, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're different. Maybe the WASP is different. Well, WASP is originally 14,900 tons. Again, there's a ratio between that and the 27,000 tons. If you... 12,000 tons is a bit light, but if you ha do have the London Treaty has 16,000 tons, well, if you have an extra 1,000 tons to play with, WASP could be very interesting. But it's not just WASP which could be interesting. If we consider Ranger. Ranger is built to also 14,800 tons in CERN. Again, could Ranger have worked if she was built to 16,000 tons in standard? Would an extra thousand tons have fixed some of the issues of Ranger? I don't know. But I do think your odds are your aircraft carriers in World War II are more survivable. The British and American and possibly even the Japanese ones are going to be far more similar because they're going to have the tonnage for armor and air groups. Uh, the British are probably going to be slightly more armor heavy than their American ones. The American ones are going to be slightly more uh, aircraft heavy than their um, British ones, and maybe have the armor in different places because of that. So the British possibly have probably have the armor on top deck. The Americans probably don't. Uh, don't. Americans probably have deck lifts. The British may or may not. The British will probably still not have deck parking because, in nice way, they still have lost aircraft over the side in the North Sea and North Atlantic. <laughs> the entire British philosophy on deck parking comes from the North Atlantic. One year alone, they lose more aircraft to the sea than they do to anything else. That is where it comes from, and that's why they don't like deck parking. Um, it's fun. So, yeah... 16,000 ton or 12,000 ton escort, and you could have had 12,000 ton light carriers being produced all this time as well, which could be a fun scenario, because again, if you can build as many of those as you like, perhaps British and Americans have both been building them. Who knows? Who knows what has happened in terms of that tonnage? So the Americans get the USS United States. They only get one of those, though. And that's going to should be a template and show them an interesting thing. So then they're going to have that tonnage free to build new stuff. And they will do. They might well turn around to the Yorktown class and order, you know, four or five or uh, four of them or five of them. And go, yeah, here's all the tonnage. Because let's say you can allow to build a Yorktown, uh, you're allowed to build the United States of up to 38,000 tons. Got 160,000 tons limitation. That leaves you with 122,000 tons. So you decide to divide that between four carriers. You get 40, 000, uh, you get 30,500 tons in standard for each one. Think about the carry you can build. That the Yorktowns are probably going to be closer to Essexes than anything else.
And I haven't even got into the, uh, the Japanese carriers because, honestly, the Japanese carriers could be massively different. Especially if that second London Treaty comes through. They could have been built, trying to build carriers under 12,000 tons. Well, that could actually make them work. They're still, probably still, gonna, still probably going to build them top heavy, but that could have worked. If you've got a 16,000 ton light carrier, that's a different scenario. That's, that's going to change things and things that they're going to be building. They could be getting those. Again, if they get the ratios. Because, again, it's a 553. So, the, the, the Japanese, historically have 96,000 tons. That means they could build six 16,000 ton carriers on their treaty limitation and three of the larger carriers. If they do com convert Amagi and Kaga, as they did traditionally, well, the world could be very different. But the thing is, they probably won't convert Kaga because one of the things we did consider earlier was maybe they complete the Tosas. In which case, Tosa and Kaga are completed as battleships. If the Japanese decide to do that and then build two new ships later on, then who knows what happens? What ship is going to be used instead of Kaga? It could be one of the Amagis is actually is, is far enough a lot is actually an option. It could be one of the Amagis. And the other Amagis. So instead of, um, instead of Amaga, uh, instead of um, when Amagi is lost, instead of Akagi going on its own and having to convert Kaga, they might go to one of the other ones, and push on. So th they, it, this is a, these are all options which could happen. As has been pointed out, the Max of Carry Battles could be larger and timeline much earlier. It's a really interesting scenario from that perspective. And it's a logical scenario because of the presence of the larger battle cruisers. Because you will want your battle your aircraft carriers to be going faster. They're going to be part of dealing with a battle cruiser threat on the economic warfare front. They're going to be part of the scouting groups going out from the so they're going to be part of British insistence. So I've gone with the largest treaty, but even if you go thirty thousand tons, it's going to make a big difference. Even if you consider, if the British have a limit of 150,000 tons, what does that take off their 26,500 ton limit? Well, it takes roughly 1,500 tons, so it's still 25,000 tons. You're still heading towards an implacable class. You're still able to look at something which, if it's got three engines, three shafts, you know, three turbo, a three shaft configuration for its engines, can have 72 aircraft on a full sized hangar like Ark Royal, can have the armor, possibly is a slightly longer, slightly larger ship. You know, that the, the British can build that. Again, Maximus, the Pearl Harbor attack could be more devastating, but it could also be very different. The capital ships involved could be very, very different. The present, where their presence could be is completely different. You could have to carry task forces out, and each of those could have a cat. Could each of those could have a Lexington with them, and that would change Coral Sea and Midway, because if you have a Lexington, well, you could put a lot of avia air defence on a Lexington class. And Tim Richards, they can go with six Yorktowns if they want on 20,000 tons of space. That could well be the case. There is also a scenario. One of the things you have to consider in all of this is if Japan goes away with some wins, instead of like the Washington Treaty where they felt... They went away with some recognition. It was enough to initially feel successful, but longer term, they felt they'd been defeated and felt they'd been crushed. If they go away with the ability to build some ships, if they go away with the, from the Washington Treaty with the ability to build some ships, they go away from the London Treaty with the ability to build some ships and build some aircraft carriers and do this uh, X and Y, Z, they might well feel more secure. They might well feel more like they can defend themselves. And nations which feel more secure are less paranoid. 
If you want to make a nation paranoid, you make it feel insecure. If you want a nation to start acting out and be dangerous, you make it feel insecure. If you want a nation to do nasty things, you make it feel insecure. There are other criteria as well which can do the same thing, but the biggest one is always insecurity. And Japan, after the Washington Naval Treaty, feels insecure. Ronan, there is, in the nicest way, the RN lost it in 1918 due to decisions taken in World War One to do uh, due to uh, a mythical idea of a engine surplus, which was going to lead to a massive strategic bombing campaign and the need to unite the uh, apparently you need to unite the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Air Force and the Royal Naval Air Service into one service to in order to coordinate such a strategic bombing campaign. Um, that is not a consideration which is going to change because of a treaty in 1922. It's just not going to happen. As for the Royal Navy getting it back earlier, well, if you have larger aircraft carriers and they're more a part of the fleet, the Royal Navy is going to be probably trying even more, but it's probably still going to be the 1937 Inskip report. So... No, the USA thought that the US, the people doing the negotiations of the US felt that if they were overwhelmingly strong compared to the Japanese, that would protect them against war because what would be the logic for the Japanese in fighting them when they're overwhelmingly strong compared to them? That's the correct logic. But the trouble is you also made Japan feel overwhelmingly weak, which means Japan is now scared, which means Japan's going to start acting irrationally. There is a logic behind the American assessment. It is a, a lot. It is a logic. It's just not a sound one because it forgets to take into account, uh, into account the feelings of the other side. So, summary. Well. The first thing is first, I've already been into this a bit, but I don't think Yamato class get built. Not as they are. I think if you've had some construction going on, especially if they continue that in the London Treaty, if the Japanese get to build some ships, maybe even replace the Congos in the London Treaty, I don't know. Um, that seems to be something popular with all of you in the chat. I don't really see that as being necessarily a popular thing for them, because the need to replace the Congos is less than the need to replace other ships in their criteria. I would say the ships they're most going to want to place under any London treaty, if they're allowed to replace them, will be uh, Yamashiro, Fuso, Ize, and Hayuga. I would say they're far more high up on their priority list to replace rather than Kirishima, Haruna, Hie, and Kongo. Um, The idea of leading the 14-inch gunships to the battle cruisers and having their 16-inch gunships entirely for their battle line would be very attractive to the Japanese, I could see. The scenario, therefore, is going to be, if you've got construction going on, whilst it makes it more possible for you to do something like the Yamatos, your need to do it is going to be different, because why are you putting, why are you putting your eggs all in these baskets, these eggshells, when you've got the ability to build others? The thing is, it's going to depend on the treaty. It's going to, honestly, it with a more equitable, and this is not necessarily an equitable treaty, but it's a more equitable treaty than the original Washington Treaty. You end up with a scenario where the Japanese have got more buy-in into the treaty system, so leaving it is more of a problem for them. They get more of an advantage out of it. They get the limitations. Because remember, the treaty works both ways. It limits them, but it also limits the Americans and the British. And it keeps that if the Japanese play it another way, they become an important potential ally for either one of those powers to offset the other. You know, they basically set themselves up as the king, as potentially the kingmaker, as long as they can be that in an American, American Anglo-Britain British system. Unfortunately, the Anglo-British relations are interesting and in depth, and absurd on occasions. Hello, George Newman. Absurdly close on occasions. It's one of the things, again, I discussed when going into this. I would say for the Germans, I've already been over their problems. This doesn't help them in any way, shape, or form. It makes their lives a lot worse. I would 
I don't not sure if they're going to be large carriers, the Yamatos, the equivalents. I think I think the Japanese might actually be producing a more balanced fleet, in which case the Japanese might not be quite so focused in on them and might have a more balanced and ultimately scarier fleet in that regard. I'm not sure what their equivalent's going to be. It's going to depend on whether the cumulative tonnage limitation went down into cruisers or not. Because otherwise they could be seeking offset advantage in numbers of cruisers. And long-range torpedoes. Uh, that could be it. They could actually go more down that route. So it could be they continue building the 16-inch gun ships, but as long as there's no cumulative limits on their cruiser construction, they build as many cruisers as they can. Mm, that's the probability. That's something I would certainly see no could there again. And they do have the problem of oil, but again, it's it's a case of stockpile it or you know, whatever happens. I, the, you know, the Japanese problem of oil is the same as the Italians, and they, these nations both knew it before World War II began. So that the idea that they could do would do something different in this scenario is a completely is probably not likely. They have necessarily more of a reason to it. They're brought into the more into the system. But also the thing is, if they're brought more into the system, there's things that are going to be a differential. There's also going to be a differential in terms of the scenario you're dealing with. Because if the Italians have eight good, fast battleships, that potentially ties down more of the British forces in World War II. But it also potentially, you know, with the consideration that we've talked about, means the Germans have less. So the British might not need capital ships in the North Sea or North Atlantic because the Germans might not have anything that's worthy of them. In which case, the British could be concentrating whatever new, their newer capital ships in the Mediterranean to deal with the Italians and their larger carriers. And that changes things again because if you consider... Okay, so let's say the carriers worked out the scenario. You still use you still lose glorious and courageous as historically. Let's say for somehow without Scharnhorst and Eisenau, the Germans still accomplish Norway somehow. You know, without the capabilities, the security day bring, they still run a Norway campaign, and you still lose. Um, glorious and you I know mean, I, we haven't added in any extra small or small carriers doing the anti-submarine operations instead of courageous and sort of that scenario. But likely those things do happen in this scenario. So likely you don't lose uh, glorious and courageous. Your actual HMS Illustrious is going to be a far larger carrier and a far more capable vessel. And this is your Ark Royal, which could mean to lead to all number of scenarios when it comes to Taranto if that takes place. And yes, the Francisco Caracolas are going to be better defended and, but so were the Latorios. The Latorios were much better defended than the Francisco Caracolas were against submarine attacks. And yet, look at what happens to them in Taranto. <coughs> torpedo uh, no, torpedo attacks. So if you have a larger carrier that will have a larger air group it has a larger air group, i.e. 72 aircraft air group, then you could well be dealing with something which is launching a strike of 36 swordfish, 18 skewers. With maybe some full Mars wandering along to provide the uh, backup fireworks of the flare dropping. You could send six of them to do the uh, flare drum. You, you could therefore have, honestly, have three waves turn up, each with 12 torpedo bombers, um, six dive bombers, and two flare droppers. Or maybe two waves of 18 torpedo bombers, nine dive bombers, and three of the flare droppers aircraft it doesn't matter that's going to be a that's going to be an increase in firepower a dramatic increase in firepower over what it was historically where you've got the roughly 24 swordfish launched which are split between dive bombing duties and flare dropping duties and torpedo bombing duties 
this scenario you end up with 36 which are just carrying torpedoes and 18 proper dive bombers with heavier bombs than the swordfish would be carrying in the roll and six dedicated flare droppers that that makes a difference in that Taranto style of scenario add in faster British capital ships as a whole and the things get incredibly scary for the Italians in which case you could have a very if you add in if Glorious has also survived then Glorious will be there with Illustrious probably uh, the larger Illustrious so will the Eagle and goodness knows how many aircraft will be launched at Taranto The scenario changes day uh, daily, but you could be talking as many as well. I wouldn't be surprised if you have roughly forty, forty-two. Yeah, forty-two come from uh, will come in a similar form from Korea from Glorious. Another twenty-four-ish from. Eagle, you, you you could be talking seventy six plus the original what I was talking about sixty, so you could be talking about one hundred and thirty six aircraft being involved in three waves of attacks or four waves of attacks. Who knows how it works out at Toronto? That's not going to be good for the Italian fleet. The yes, they could well have eight capital ships in service, but all eight could be sitting in Toronto. And with that many aircraft coming in, they are going to cause some trouble. In which case, Japan then could be looking in 1941 to a scenario where A, staying in the system has been more beneficial, so they've got a more balanced fleet, but B, they're they've got a far larger American and British fleets to deal with. They might choose a different methodology. They might not decide to ally themselves with Germany and Japan, uh, Germany and Italy. They might decide to go, you know what, why how about we ally with Britain? That might be the Japanese trump card. Instead of going to war in 1941, they could announce they declare war in recognition of the old alliance with Britain. You know, for, uh, when France, let's say, is knocked out, they, you know, they say, we remember uh, whilst we realise the treaty has lapsed, Britain well, for a long time for a long time Britain and Japan had a treaty that if we either one of us found us fighting any two powers, the other would come to aid. And the treaties lapsed officially because of the naval treaties. We see they were superseded by it. But our old friend is now fighting two powers alone. They're fighting Germany and Italy. And as such, we will declare war on Germany and Italy to support our friend in remembrance of that treaty and remembrance of times gone by. They might do that, at which point, the British going to sanction their fuel supplies? No, they're not. The British will go, here, have fuel, come to the Mediterranean, make our lives really easy. And what well, the Americans in that scenario? Do they go, well, the British, you can't allow the Japanese to join your war fighting the Germans and Italians? The British will go, well, do you join in the war? No. Well, then, why, why are we going to tell them not to? It's an entirely different world scenario you're ending up with because the whole way through you've had that much more tonnage to play with and that much more feelings of security. So yeah, it's interesting. All right, my plan was this evening to do to, to basically chat with chat and take questions for at least another twenty odd minutes. Um, and then after that, have a bit of a comfort break, because after the amount of iron brew I've drunk, I need it. Uh, and um, then go and be a, on Discord, so for a bit, but not as late as I normally go. Probably will be off by about midnight. Reason is tomorrow I'm helping someone with a bit, doing a bit of moving. So let's go to the chat. Yada dee. I have both top chat and live chat running, and it's always interesting to watch the differences. Mm. 
Now, but much less, the RN the Toronto Road with the other side of the RN frozen in most, most of the large carriers in whilst using their light carriers. Yeah, well, I've already been over that one. The Yamato would either be a long tanner design with 12 16 inch guns or 12 18 inch guns, would it be, a, uh, would be large carriers. It's quite possible that the Montanas instead, they their, their second generation of 16-inch um, battleships have been built to replace their older battleships, and they, well, they've built something to replace. Uh, they've built something of the 42,000-ton standard displacement mark, which is officially a battle cruiser replacement, but is more a fast battleship, and that could have three quadruple 16-inch turrets or something like that in it. It could be built that way. With a little bit of um, creative accounting on the tonnage. If, if Japan is able to build light carriers, Japan doesn't need to build their cruisers to carry so many planes to the scanning roll. Yeah, which is going to change their cruiser design something. Maximus, if the J Japan sides are British, they could take French into China under the projection. Well, no, but they might well ensure the French, uh, the um, Vichy French, don't get control of Indochina. In the nicest way, the, Fre the Japanese could be going in making uh, uh, with ideas that they get Italians uh, territories in Africa as part of their um, their. Uh, how do I put this? Their. Uh, reward for joining the war they could decide to contribute major forces to the requ uh, the conquest of ja of italian east africa etc again that would not be a necessarily a bad scenario they might even contribute forces to the british seizing of the uh, of the middle eastern oils uh, fields to ensure their proper supply. It's all sorts of interesting things about where entire, where Japanese troops and forces could turn up if they wish to. What are the differences? The difference is... As I've discussed, the differences mostly come down to you're able to build stuff, and that's going to change the scenario. It's also going to change the qualitative judgments, because if the British have built 11 ships in the 1920s, which is, again, not a massive amount for them, as you saw, those were, two, those were the size of 2 1 2 1 each year, which, if you consider the British were building sort of eight, six, ordering 8s and 6s a year at certain points. It's not an excessive amount for them in terms of construction or cost. And it allows them to have their stuff move forward. But it's also going to move everyone else's forward because they're going to be reacting to the British construction. So if you consider you're dealing with fourth generation 28 knot nail rods in terms of the British fleet, what is everyone else going to be building? And there is an advantage to where everyone's going to look at the British going, oh frigate, looking how much experience you have constructing that period. We don't want you off the shackle of the treaty and able to build independently. Because the British infrastructure will have stood up far better. Because of that. Um, the Italians are going to be more secure, but even more of a dominant partner, really, in their relationship with the Germans, because the Italian Navy is going to massively outclass the German Navy. They already did, historically, but... The, you know that that was with their oh, mostly uh, the, quite a large fleet of World War One vintage ships. By this point, in 1913, by the time 19 at the end of the 1930s roll around, they could have entirely got rid of them and have entirely post World War One ships if they've started off the four Caracolas and they could replace the rest with four of their 1930s build. And for the Americans, well, they they are probably going to have to start... They're probably in 1930, at least, if not earlier. They're going to have to start building a faster battle line, which is going to change their approach to their battleship modernization. It'll be an interesting one. Jacob, is there an actual difference between top and live chat? There is. 
For example, if I look at a live chat, Paul Amos has got a response to Joss Funk in that, but that this reply doesn't appear in top chat. Don't ask me why. Um, the thing is, the Dutch allies would probably possibly have sold the oil to the, the, to the, to the um, Japanese quite happily, as after all, the Dutch were the free Dutch were part of the, you know, the sort of the Anglo alliance and, you know, in Britain. So that could well change things. If Lexington is not about how do you see the technology to build a carrier, big carriers come from? Well, that's why the USS United States is interesting. If she's converted, if they do convert her, then that's going to be one thing. But also, I think if the big carrier, if they're not, then they're building them all from scratch, then it's going to be a slow progress. They're going to build generate successive generations of carriers and grow them and learn their way up. Again, that probably means the that, that you know they might well learn they need larger is better slowly so that might mean they end up with some smaller ones but they already realize they've got lung leaf they already realize that's not big enough so it's an interesting scenario how it works out but i think honestly i think that six lexington gets converted to a carrier i think the uss united states becomes an aircraft carrier and i think that's an interesting scenario for them to deal with Okay, I meant between top chat and no chat. Um, I the two differences are live chat, top chat, and then the third option is funded chat. I think it's called fan funding, and which shows any super chat, super stickers, and channel memberships. So you can theoretically have free chat screens open. I tend to just have live chat and top chat, mostly because then I can see top chat is. It's supposed to be filtering out the potential spam, but also concentrating on people who are interacting most with the channel. So live chat shows me all the all the chat. Top chat supposedly shows the people who are, you know, most engaging, theoretically, he says. Like Japanese tax and Western doesn't give the Italian some <laughs> um, Would uh, Mike West, would Japan be building torpedo farm destroyers like Shimkazi? Potentially still, so especially if they consider torpedoes their offset rather than they're not building Yamatos, they're building conventional battle cruisers like uh, conventional battleships and battle cruisers like everyone else and 16 inch gun ships, they might well be going right then torpedoes are offset. Americans might go for 12, 18 inch, 18 inch guns because they can. They might do that. Honestly, the Americans might look at 9.2 and go, well, we can go for an 8 inch gun with a slightly higher rate of fire, and we can get 12 of those guns on 12,000 tons. We'll go with that. Which could be a really interesting scenario. Um, that's right. Without World War One, how long has it delayed the World War USN carries a modernization? Honestly, that possibly doesn't happen until the late nineteen twenties, because the Americans were very ha American politicians were very happy with just building battleships and the top line of their forces and ignoring everything else below that. Don't say. You always mention never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity, which is what is the origin of the saying, and if there are different versions of the saying. Um the earliest quote I have seen referencing that is in a document is I was gonna say document, but it's a sort of it's a it's a sort of it's a sort of diplomatic text from about the 1850s. So I think it's been around for a long time now. If it's, a, if it's able to be quoted as an old saying in the 1850s, um, a variation of that, never, you know, never put it down to sort of malice or active effort, but was to stupidity, uh, or rather idiocy, as they put it at that point, is 
I think the variations have been around for a long time. And it's very true, because humans by their nature are lazy, for the most part. Even the people of most of us who are really active and keen, you know, keen and energetic and doing lots of stuff, even, and I would include myself sometimes, like that, I will tend to find and work out the easiest way to do something I want to do, rather than picking the hardest way. I won't n pick the hardest way on purpose to do something. Sometimes I have to do it the hard way, because that is the necessary way to do it right. And I wouldn't prefer to do it right, and because that'd be quicker overall than doing it wrong. But if there is a lazy way which provides a 95% solution and is a lot easier and a lot less time consuming, I'm going to do the lazy way. So is everyone else. So if you consider malice, it requires active effort, whereas stupidity is often otherwise subscribed to laziness. And that's some of the earlier versions of the phrase are sort of a laziness. So yeah, I, I would I would put it down to laziness rather than malice most of the time. Or stupidity. Lamas if Japan joins the British, would the US even have won at all? That's an interesting question. Would they need to? They probably would. Because you see, then you have the other scenario for the Americans. What happens if an Anglo-Japanese alliance wins the war versus the Italians and the Germans, dominates them? What, what, what does America then do with? Because America has to deal with, theoretically, the Japanese are now close allies with the British. And they've just fought a war alongside them, and they've got ties of blood. That's a strategic, it's a strategic massive problem for the Americans, and I am fairly certain they also joined the war on the British side, probably the day after the Japanese announced it. Possibly even the same day. Depends on how quick their their um, decoders crack the Japanese diplomatic information saying they're going to be doing it, because you can't afford for the Anglo for an Anglo-Japanese alliance to dominate the world if you're America, and that is what would happen. If the, if the Anglo-Japanese alliance wins the war, then whilst America will be powerful on paper, as far as the rest of the world is going to be concerned, the British Empire and the Japanese Empire have just won the war. And goodness knows what happens to the Soviets. Stalin could be so paranoid it's beyond belief. But... Here is the really interesting scenario. What happens if you end up fighting that life? If the Japanese join the war on the British side, they're fighting and Germany still launches their... And because they've invested perhaps more in land forces because they haven't been investing less in their large and large surface units, they might... And less in their submarines possibly as well. Less in their navy overall because of the limitations of the treaty. Uh... You might end up with the alliance of Japan, the so Imperial Japan and Japan, which had just fight a war against the Russians, remember? The Soviet Union and the British. Would the Americans really like that alliance to be dominating the world post-war? Uh, post no. The Americans want to be part of that. But it could change the things like the, uh, the like post-World War II United Nations Security Council grouping. It could be France might still get to be a member. It might still get to be a member. But it could be Britain, Japan, the Soviet Union and America. Instead of China, under that scenario. And the whole thing is China might be forgotten entirely in that scenario. Realistically, it could be the cost of doing business as far as the British are concerned and as far as the Americans again not being concerned. I mean, my name is, if the British were building large cruisers, why would they go for mini renowned style designs and a mini hood style design? Um, it all depends on what they decide is the most efficient. They might even... Again, this is something... Sorry, if the British are building more Nelrod style battleships and Nelrod style battle cruisers, that becomes the British signature style. And they might even build their cruisers as all forward ships. All forward main armament ships. The USS United States I'm talking about is the unfinished Lexington class, not the ocean liner. It 
So you've got all this selling oil to Japan and Japanese and sets in American oil. I'm not happy US made me maybe no land lease. Maybe no land lease, but there again, as said, the American scenario becomes more a It might actually be the Americans have to be even more, do a more interesting version of land lease scenario to try and make sure that they have a closer relationship with the British than the Japanese do. It's There's all sorts of complications that come in from that scenario. That becomes a whole nightmare scenario for the Americans to deal with. For the British, it turns them into the courted power rather than the courting power. Think about that. And for the Japanese, it's being a, a chance to fight and test their equipment and develop it all miles away from the actual war zone with no one actually beating up their own country. And who knows what technology the British will actually share with them. That's, this is an interesting scenario. Kurt McDavid, I have to go unmask the wheelbarrow and put it away. Good luck. Black Mask, would Japan still invade China, especially in the scenario where they join the British? Also, how would the, the Zero fare in the Mediterranean? Interesting, I'm not sure how the Zero... Uh, the Zero would probably be an interesting one in the Mediterranean. The entire Japanese air group could be interesting in the Mediterranean if they're there. Um, as for them invading China, well, they've historically already invaded China, and that war is actually ongoing at this period. That's why sometimes people date the World War II's beginning back to earlier, in uh, earlier in the 1930s and 1939, because of the involvement of Japan fighting China, and that's that. You know, the Sino-Japanese War does go into World War II and does become part of it. So yeah, you can date it earlier. But do they launch the larger scale offensive? Depends what forces they're committing and where they are in deployed in the world and what's going on. But again, the Chinese might not be getting the support from the the I mean, uh, the arms support from the British and the Americans under this scenario, because remember, a lot of that support comes across from British territories. If Japan's announced declared war and is fighting on your side, and would. Churchill really turn around to Japan and go, no, we don't want you after they've declared war on me. It's a very difficult position. Churchill can't really say no. Carl was redistributed as Ian Machiavelli wrote about it in The Prince. Yes, he doesn't actually use that phraseology, but he does write about it in The Prince, and that's, yeah, that's an older, a much older document. So it's a case of, it, uh, when I was asked about that phraseology, I said it's required, it's considered an old saying in 1850 in a diplomatic document I read. So, you know, you've had it around as a concept for a long, long time. Sim Richards, if 20,000 time cruiser built the pony is 9.2 inch guns, does the fast firing 6 inch come in about early or late? Probably about the same time because of the same reasoning. Six inch, the fast firing 6 inch gun comes around because of the technological development and the pace of that development. So I would say it comes about about the same time. And there is the possibility that a less navy, more army orientated Germany actually cracks the USSR line before Lend Lease comes into effect. Depends. Will Hitler, as he traditionally did, historically did, decide to take forces off the principal thrust to go and do other attacks? If he does, it probably still has the same problem and still winds, in, winds into the same issues in uh, the Soviet Union. But, you know. Listen, what does America do in a Cold War where you have a powerful British and Britain and Japan? Well, it depends on how World War II has turned out and what's happened to Britain, etc. in that time and what's happened to others. But you could well end up with a scenario where, as said, that's the United Nations... And the Americans might well think that under that scenario, they have an advantage because the Soviet Union will be the only communist power in that bloc. America and Britain will be democracies 
And Japan is a pseudo democracy slash military dictatorship. Um, it's an interesting scenario. It's more like the show. It's more a traditional continuation of the shogunate. In but instead of it being called a shogun, they're called various other ti titles in style, it's a style of rule. Um, yeah. That's interesting, but that might be considered an ex a more acceptable, uh, more acceptable partner than the United States, USSR, especially if the fear is that it will be a communist China. So it's it's a it's a, all sorts of interesting scenarios. As Stefan's point out, China possibly has to give up their northeast and a bunch of port leases if they had to guess. Potentially, yeah. It would make something like the Panayans, and if it would happen, very awkward for the US. Yep. Uh, yeah, it, I, I think you could well find a lot of the IJ and the IJN, are, especially the active officers, are deployed to the Mediterranean and uh, that sort of area doing a lot of fighting. Honest, if Churchill said no, then Japan might, well, could, would probably, but might take that as a snub and do what they did historically, so he wouldn't say no. Nope. When Furlan, Churchill would say yes. I mean, he said yes to Stalin. They all quote about saying nice things about the devil if he was fighting the failed painter. painter. Um, yes. My good, if Japan draws war, does Italy look in an IJN carrier group in the Mediterranean capital? So please, well, if you consider you have whatever the IJN has is bringing, whatever the British are focusing there, um, and whatever the the Italians have left, honestly, yeah, you might have something interesting. The thing is, I always had this sort of in the back of my mind that if Taranto goes to well the way it could go, um, and if you know Japan, as said, could have joined earlier when France was, if Taranto if you consider the scenario if Japan joins World War II before after the fall of France but before Taranto we've already talked about it, what would happen if there's three British carriers large carrier, British cat large carriers there what happens if there's three Japanese carriers join in as well now the British carriers can do night strikes but what happens if they do the night strike and then in the morning there's a Japanese attack on Taranto the British might not even tell them the trick about their torpedoes and how they drop them. Doesn't really matter that Japanese turning up the next uh, the next morning with a massive wave. That's going to guarantee that nothing floats away from there. In which case, the Italian fleet ceases to exist. In which case, does Mussolini stay in power? And that's a problem for them. That's a pro that means Italy falls out the war, which could mean the end of the war in North Africa very quickly. In which case you have the Anglo-Japanese um, alliance and the free forces focusing on reinvasion of Europe. Without a strong navy, has Germany taken Norway? I've already done a video about what happens if they don't take Norway, that sort of issue. In this scenario, it, it doesn't doesn't look good for them at all. It really doesn't. So, I don't think the Americans don't join in on that. And I don't think you end up with a US-France alliance. Because again, the French aren't going to be separated off from the British. They've been, they're, they're too dependent in this period on the British for their security. The, the Anglo-French alliance breaks down after the Suez Canal because the British, after the Suez Crisis, because the British, the French see the British as conceding to the Americans too quickly, and realizing that the Americans, the British, prefer the Americans to the French. Um, so that isn't happening. So the U.S. are going to want in on that alliance. They're going to want in on that group because they have no influence on it from the outside, and from the outside, that's a pro that can be scary. If the iron infrastructure is maintained, we'll still be having armor for the Czechs. Mainly we're buying, uh, buying the armor from the Czechs so that the Germans can buy it. So, yeah, we'd still be getting the armor from the Czechs. What would be fitted to? Who knows?
Would Japanese land forces still fight in Europe? Not sure on that one, but let's be honest. Do you can you imagine the IJA uh, the uh, the uh, Imperial Japanese Army's approach idea of we get to go and fight the German army who we consider the be uh, the best and beat them? There's a lot of honor in that battle. There's a lot of honor in that fight. So yeah. And if the Americans are going as well, they, they, you could get a very interesting landing in northern France. I mean, you could get a really interesting landing in northern France. <laughs> oh, good lord. The sheer amount of battleships you'd have turning up is quite disturbing, but the sheer amount of forces landing... Um, yeah, I, 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 it's just it's just a potential nightmare for. Them. There is no scenario where this happens, which is good for Germany. I have been talking a lot about the winner. The big loser of any of this sort of scenario, any of this treaty system, is Germany. Germany just just gone. Germany as a the German navy just ceases to really sort of matter because, and I don't mean that in a funny way. The, the thing is, if you consider, they've still got limits. And if they start building submarines in numbers earlier, A, the Anglo-German Naval Treaty is probably going to be different. B, the British calculation for the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. Remember, the Anglo-German Naval Treaty is signed because the British are worried about building up their forces and rebuilding and re-creating their forces because of the damage of the treaties. Under this scenario, the British have maintained a far larger force, so they're not as weak. So they might not sign the Anglo-German Naval Treaty, in which case the Germans might not even have that as political cover to build submarines. I.e., the moment they start building submarines, they're in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, at which point they could get declared war on. And the British and the French are both going to be navally in a lot better positions than they were, historically. Um... What does that matter militarily? Well, na if then if the naval force are in better positions, then the British could well do nasty things to Germany, and they only need the Poles to also invade from their side, and the French and the British come in from the east, and the Polish army. Remember, the Polish army has been beating up the Soviet Union for most of the 1920s and 30s, so, and whenever they've tried to invade them, so they're a fairly worked up and well uh, well organized army. If that happens early enough. Yeah, so the Germans might not even be starting on submarines until 1939, or until war starts, then they might start working on submarines actually properly, just doing some quiet designs, Netherlands, etc. on them. So, you could be dealing with a very different German Navy scenario, you could be dealing with a very different... The entire scenario changes so many things, it is almost impossible to see all the permutations. Jigo, wasn't the USSR the main land enemy of Japan before uh, beside China? Yes, they were. Then there is this, uh, there is the scenario where the secret German USSR military development cooperation uh, comes into a neutral stance after Poland. There is that possibility, but there is also the possibility that America USSR gets told to remove itself from Poland. That there's all sorts of interesting things. Uh, when British could strike the airfields around the base at night and laying mines and harbour entrance, then have the Japanese strike the fleet at harbour. No, the British would go for the fleet. Uh, I, I'm, I, you're you're a very nice. That's a very nice strategic operation idea. But no, the British will be going for fleet because they want to sink the ja sink the Italian battleships, and they know their system works in harbors, and they they have an idea about the Japanese system, and they won't think that will necessarily work in shallow waters like theirs does. Because remember, the British are the only ones who have the tension wire on their torpedo heads, which means that when the torpedo drops, it belly flops. The Japanese and the Americans both have fins, which helps, but you need fins, the extra wooden fin extensions, <laughs> and the tension wire to ensure the belly flop. The shallow running is what what causes the damage to the Italian battleships, and the British notice, and the British are not going to back down on wanting to do that attack. Um, 
Vision. IJ with Sherman Tanks? Potentially, who knows? Who knows what happens in this scenario? In this scenario, there is the very real possibility that Germany doesn't... Uh, that, you know, in, uh, they if they don't push for submarines, they don't have any fleet... Uh, they could... It, it, then they don't do Norway. They might not do an invasion of Norway at all. So... All sorts of things change. Um... Nice turn. How different is the Harrier for the British if they had access to the Sea Harrier and Harrier 2? The British developed the Harrier, so I'm presuming if the, you're, you're asking question if, if they get a Sea Harrier, possibly Sea Harrier 2, which would be is a better one, and the Harrier 2, a Sea Harrier and Harrier 2, or the Sea Harrier 2, if they get access to the better enhanced aircraft. Then they probably build a copy that and build that. Maybe do some slight improvements on it, but it's the Harrier is developed by the British, so yeah, that, it's just nice to have an event of a, a copy of something developed a few years later. Um, I just want to, after all, you're not wanting for shipping if not finding Japanese. That is the other advantage. Japan has really good landing craft. Yes, they do have really good landing craft. In Smarrison, what if the Japanese army still wants a war in China? They probably still do want a war in China. But the question is, do, are the British prepared? If the Japanese are on their side and are fighting against the Germans... Are the British going to bother that much about China? And also, if the German, if the if the you know, it might be a case of we'll deal with that later. The current problem is the war against Germany, and potentially Italy. If Japan is on our side fighting them, we will ignore that. But also, the Japanese will be set. Uh, if you consider the the cost of sending resources around the world to Britain to fight in Europe, etc., if they're sending sufficient enough resources, etc., they might well not be able to widen the war in in China. So it might be left as it is. No, to be fair, it's the large one. The thing is, if the tor no, you are both right and also slightly wrong because if the torpedo runs shallow it hits the sh it hits the ship if it dives in a shallow harder it tends to hit the s hit the seabed and go all the the harbor of the floor and bury itself in it so that's your problem shallow means it hits target diving means it probably doesn't They can, my coach. Polymus. Germany might not even have attacked the USA if Japan ends one and gives up. Germany may still be only with Poland. <sighs> Germany might uh, get wiped out far quicker. It's oh, it's a massive thing. So what insane alternate history did I just walk into? It's a very interesting scenario once you go down this route. Because of the differences. And because of the strategic calculations. Now... <coughs> There is a scenario that Japan still decides to ally with Germany and Italy and everything goes much the same. But the thing is, Germany would still not be as strong as they were, and Italy would still probably get that <clears throat> free carrier smackdown in Toronto, which would mean there would still be a far larger force of the British at Singapore, which could change the entire invasion of Malaysia, etc., so yeah, it's it's either way it's a very different world. I, yeah. If it fails to detonate. But the thing is, if it hits the bottom, and if you consider what happens to Japanese torpedoes in Pearl Harbor which is actually slightly deeper in points than the harbour at Taranthro. 
um, what happens to it in terms of the number of them hitting the bed if you extrapolate that over the numbers of torpedoes used by British the British torpedoes very rarely hit the bed in fact there's literally two which don't or which um, don't do what they're supposed to so yeah if the torpedoes fail to go off that's another problem but if the tor if you're already if you're basically saying this is the number of percentage of torpedoes which hit the bed and that's half to two thirds and then we take off the percentage of torpedoes which fail to go off that's a far bigger number than if you're going right then we've lost one in ten torpedoes to hitting the bed and another one in uh, of the remaining ones one third failed to go off right then so that's 15 torpedoes hit their targets whereas if you've as said if you lost 50 if you've got I'm talking about 18 torpedoes and it's again let's say half half and uh, 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 sort of um, don't uh, hit the half hit the floor then you've got nine gone and then of the nine remaining ones yeah you, it, it, just, it just doesn't work out the same I presume the flashpoints for Japan twenties and early thirties were covered earlier. They were base, uh, they were covered, but there are it's a different. The flashpoint, the flashpoints change. This is some of the point you have to consider. The flashpoints change if Japan feels more secure and if they've got construction, if they've got buy-in into the treaty system. Yes, well, the explosive it damages the explosive, but the first of all, it has to get to its target. That's always the most important thing. If the explosive fails to get anywhere near its target, it going off doesn't help anywhere. And whilst that does cause damage, first it has to get there. It's my main discussion when I'm talking about blist anti-ship ballistic missiles. First of all, it's a very powerful weapon, but first of all, it has to get to its target, and the same with hypersonics, it has to get to its target. And people always seem to presume it's going to get to its target. And that's the first point of failure. <clears throat> Decision. Were Japan, some factions want to exit China because of the scale of things we're eating too many resources. A European war of US, UK allies, great strength for factions hand. Especially if they're looking at maybe getting the Italian East Africa as their compensation. China versus the Italian East Africa, you know, these sort of things could be interesting. Right. So it's been four hours, and I said I'm going to have a little bit of a, a break, uh, a little bit of a comfort break, not not that long, but a little bit of a comfort break, and then I will be on Discord chatting with people in the general chat. Uh, what we've got coming up, we have viewer suggestion number four. Still waiting comments, but I'm going to be recording that probably considering it's a long patrol so I can record it with a script or rather point, note pointers on that screen and do all the recording I will probably be taking as long as it, uh, as long as they're in by end of today Saturday if you put a comment with a viewer su comment with the phrase viewers suggested in it so I can easily find and go through it I will be looking at them but I do reserve the right as always to aggregate viewer suggestions when lots of people are making similar suggestions and what else we've got coming up battleships and battle cruisers that might have been will come out tomorrow evening I'm sorry due to various things it didn't get didn't get edited and delivered in time which is why um, the video that went up on Wednesday did went up on Thursday because I wasn't going to miss, miss Vos Tuesday and Wednesday night. I felt bad enough it didn't go up on Tuesday. And so the key ships that's scheduled for you tomorrow is going to be delayed till next week. And what we've got coming up next week, we've got the Empress of Augusta Bay. Now that is going to be me doing that from a travel lodge. Woo hey! Because I'm doing some traveling. So yeah. That'll be fun. 
but it's the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay from 1943. And the patron vote is still live, and please go and vote. There are, it's, if you're a patron, go and vote. It's always fun. Anyway. Blackburn Maximus, thank you. Good night. Thank you, Joss Funk. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Nautical Wolf. Thank you, Stephen David. Thank you, John Shea. DG40. Thank you, HRS Ferdan. Thank you, Renan. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you, Carl Gasbo. Thank you, Manny6040. Thank you, thank you, Steve Richards. Thank you, Juicy Suji. Thank you, and hello, Juicy Suji. Thank you, Ian's Morrison. Thank you, Runon. Thank you, Leslie Mitchell. Thank you, Longbow. Plains Fox. Thank you, Bishron. Thank you, Geo Guy. Thank you, HMS Verdun. Thank you, uh, Calvin Gersberg. Thank you for joining us. Um, Night Secretary for one, of course. Paul Amos. Thank you, Just uh, Cody eighty five. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, who else? Uh, then we have. There's there are other people here. I know. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Sam McDavid. Thank you. Um, Steve Clark. I think I'm going to say that already. It might not. Have. Thank you, Jeff Beeler. Thank you. Ooh, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't I missed ch chatting you. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Seven Kratu. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There is some. Uh, I've said Longbow. Um, David Brennan. Thank you. And Nemo. Thank you. I'm trying to get for everyone, I'm trying to make sure I say thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for being part of the live. It's always fun to chat away with people. Thank you, Frank Sposato, and thank you, Garris the Brit, of course. You know, someone I was forgetting. And Amelia Burrow, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. I hope you had a nice time. Hope you enjoyed it, and thank you. Thank you, EA History, and thank you, De Brock. Uh, thank you, Abazaski, and thank you, Bill Galactica. Joan has also given various uh, given various military aid to China, but withdraw this with the tripartite pact. So, could have been supporting China if Japan's allies were in. Yeah, they could have been, but uh, let's be honest, the amount of aid that's going to get out there with uh, Je Anglo-Japanese alliance fighting them is going to be minimal to non-existent. Thank you, DH89, and thank you, everyone. Take care. Ba -da -da -ding. I'm hungry. Have I had food today? Oh, good lord, that's a question. I can't remember. Frigate, have I forgotten to have lunch? <laughs> oh, Ikaromba. You are a Tonga. You are an absolute Tonga. Da da diddy. Da-da-da-dee, 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 we'll go sailing. <laughs>